It is showtime. Hey, it's true. Hey, we're going live. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Hello, everyone, and welcome to another super exciting episode of Lore Beards. And this is going to be a fun one because, as we all know out there, I don't do an awful lot of the total warring yet because I'm halfway through converting my garage to be my big games room thing. So for me, this one is much more of a technical experience in that I've read all the stuff, I know all the things, but I've not actually played with them, unlike a certain somebody on this side. But before we turn to him, I do have one question. <laughs> Can we be heard out there? Is our sound okay? Because it's always worth you confirming that just to make sure I don't sound stupid. Like it normal. looks like we're good. It looks like we're good. Excellent. Yeah, so uh, we got a lot of fun things to talk about today. We're going to be focusing mostly on all everything that came with Shadows of Change, which is we're going to be talking about a lot of the new stuff, but we're also going to be cycling around a couple of the old things that we didn't get around to back when Shadows of Change originally came out, like the Changeling. Uh, we'll talk about him a bit today, uh, which should be super duper fun. But uh, yeah, it's good to see you all. Uh, hopefully everyone is ready for a calmer stream than the last one we did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was super fun. I did enjoy that. Uh Huge amount. If you didn't catch it, uh, Sotek and I went toe-to-toe -to -toe regarding a gigantic battle between Dark Elves and the good old Tomb Kings of Kemri. And I had an enormous amount of fun over that. It was proper silly. If you haven't checked that, go check over onto Sotek's channels right now, because if you aren't already subscribed over there, you should be, because we had a whale of a time discussing what would happen should Malekith face off against Setra. And we created a scenario which we didn't create ourselves. It was created by the community. And it's fair to say I was on the back foot for a good chunk of that, <laughs> particularly when <laughs> the entire horde descended upon a single black arc. But it is an enormous fun. Go take a check of it. The uh, vote for who wins is still open because all parts of it was 100% interactive. Whoever was there in the day decided what happened. And whoever wins is decided by everybody out there already. It's over in the community tab on my, as in the Lawhammer uh, YouTube channel. So do go take a check at that. Where you are right you now, want. probably. Yeah, totally. <laughs> so go into the community tab and do check and click on who you think should win. But not till you've watched the stream itself over in Sotex channel. And uh, we'll have news about further episodes of that in the future. <laughs> oh, man. Press it. You're not wrong. <laughs> um, it's fair to say, just before we went live, we were, as we always do, having a wee chat. And I was like, oh, there's this thing that I'm a bit negative about. And I don't know if I want to be negative about it. And, uh, you know, Lord Master over there said, nah, just be negative. Because sometimes <laughs> there's a good reason to be negative because there's something there that you want to say. And I was like, yeah, we'll see. Because I do like to whine sometimes. Obligations must be met. Tarmacon must rise. I I will be. Sh I I feel pretty good. It's not going to be that long before we're doing Tarmacon here on Lorebeards. Uh, yeah, that's going to be will, super fun. Yeah, that will be very very interesting. Uh, and Recyclops, thank you. Hey, oh, thank you so much. That. That's that's super sweet. nice. Yeah. So, uh, let's get into it. Of uh, there yeah. are a couple of really cool things. Uh, I think the number one thing to start with that is the most fun, in my opinion, of all the new things that kind of started with, and unless you have a preference of where to start, I, I do was not. Thinking, I think it'd be good to start with the new Cathay stuff. Of that, it really opened up a lot of very interesting cans of worms, which is good. Like that's that's my kind of preferred version of when they introduce new things into the game. I think the best thing to do is when they kind of just like throw just some kind of flash bomb into somewhere we've never been before and go, oh look at all these cool things that could be a thing now, um, which is really really exciting. Um, which with uh, Cathay, which uh, probably the fun thing to start with there is the concept of, there are a lot of really interesting things to start with. But <laughs> there is, who's going to start? Yeah, I think the one that leaps out at me, I think I want to save the special character for the last thing we talked about. Mm. So I think the first thing I found particularly interesting to discuss would be uh, the concept of purifying chaos creatures. Oh, that was a one. Those good old winged. Wow. Yeah, so for those unaware, uh, if you read through the articles that they put out about Grand Cathay of the New Units, we have the Celestial Lion, which the Celestial Lion is the big old lion beastie. It's kind of got like bird looking front limbs and then regular lion back limbs. And it's got the big multicolored wings and it's super duper cool looking. Mm -hmm. And in the statement for it, they deliberately call out that these creatures are, they are natural denizens of Cathay, so to speak. But it, what it basically kind of he very heavily hints at is that they used to be manticores or something similar to manticores. And then the Celestial Dragon Emperor did 
purified them <laughs> and turned them into what they are now. And they became celestial creatures that now hunt the forest of the moon, which is the big forest around the, I think it's the Kulan mountain range in central Cathay, which supposedly those are the mountains where not only the dragons, the celestial dragon emperor hatched originally, but that's also a forest that's very, very important to the moon empress. That's a lot of their powers mm -hmm. kind of coalesced around that area. So we have this super interesting creature that it, it, it's it's when I think for a lot of like um, a layman, so to speak, or like people that aren't terribly familiar with Warhammer, they might look at that phrase and go, oh, that's really cool. He like he exercised the evil out of them. But for those people that are more familiar with Warhammer to see the word purify something of chaos is like, oh, oh that's that's kind of scary. <laughs> that's like. And it's also a somewhat spicy take. Um, yeah. it, now, it could be very easy to simply say, oh, that's a really nice thematic piece of background writing. That's all it is. It's just, aha, we have taken a thing. We said it came from chaos and now it no longer is because it has been purified. But it's also worth reflecting what this means for the rest of the various creatures across the Warhammer world and what they represent. Now, there has long been this general idea that if it doesn't come from real world Earth, it is somehow chaotic, as hmm. in that the Warhammer world doesn't really have anything that is properly indigenous other than maybe dragons and some other crazy big things from before the arrival of the old ones. So anything like your griffins or your hippogriffs or your various weird gigantic creatures, all of them have been to either a greater or a smaller degree influenced by chaos. Now, this has been the case for, oh, I don't know. I mean, mm. almost since the fourth edition of the game. Yeah, before it wasn't that, a long time. yeah, fourth. So we're talking the 90s, almost the early 80s in terms of how it was expressed. But you tend to find that most of the army lists, when they presented these big creatures, very much laid them out as, for all this may once have been the case, it most definitely kind of isn't anymore. Griffins are just griffins. Or mm. giant bears that are unlike normal bears aren't in any way touched by chaos. But this one single line suggests that they may still all be somehow intrinsically linked with and perhaps even corrupted by chaos. Now, compare that with, say, for example, all of the comics that have variously described the High Elves and how they manifest. There's a lovely one where Graham McNeil has a bunch of, uh, in fact, it was uh, during the uh, ride, the Great Incursion of Chaos, and someone flies all the way over to Ulthuin on a griffin, as you do, and a bunch of um, <laughs> uh, giant eagles fly over um, from Ulthuin and come up, and the eagles speak to the griffin, because they can all talk, because they're all sentient, not that the rider of the griffin knows this, and they turn out to be super sentient creatures. The basic core that we have for these now is that for all that they're working with the High Elves and are intrinsically linked, they're still chaos things. And it's it's an interesting take it's an interesting spin because it suggests that they have to be somehow purified to be like the good old celestial celestial lions which by the way for me are super cool entity because i'd already added them to my game for my nipponese side so the fact that they've been <laughs> added in, <laughs> the fact that they've been added in um into the total war game for me was super awesome because i was like oh well i could just nab that look pop it over job done um made it the easiest thing to create but i find the whole concept of just that one tiny line potentially very deep and meaningful for the whole setting if this is the strong take that's going to be taken forward yeah and it it opens such an interesting debate on like andy said there's always kind of been this thing of like oh a lot of the creatures that we know now didn't exist before like the cataclysm and then the cataclysm mm -hmm. happened and a whole lot of creatures came into existence that then sort of stabilized where it's like, oh, your griffins are griffins. But, you know, they kind of played around with this in, uh, like, 8th edition, where they introduced the concept that the Empire has been breeding their griffins together and got a rare mutation where they have two heads. And they were able to pull that off by using, uh, like, special kinds of breeding that it kind of gives off the implication of, like, oh, there's, there's still that little nascent element of mutation in them. It's just really, really minor. But it, once again as Andy was saying, kind of leans heavily on, okay, where does the line between what is a chaos creature end and what isn't start, which has always been kind of an interesting discussion of like, you have manticores, which a lot of people, when they look at, they go, oh, well, that's clearly like an evil chaos creature. It runs around the Warriors of Chaos roster and all that stuff. 
but it was always very fun to read about how like there were groups within Bretonia or the Empire that had a standard with the image of a manticore because they found elements of the manticore to be very ferocious and it was known for standing its ground and being like a particularly frenzied opponent and like it wasn't considered a noble creature necessarily but it was certainly considered a powerful creature but they didn't view it as like a chaos monster it was just a monster yeah and i think it's worth reinforcing that because uh there is from the warhammer world perspective there is no difference between an elephant and a manticore or right. a rhino um and a great lamasu um oh, admittedly i've chosen winged things but if you see what i mean anything that is big um is just as weird as anything else that's big and is just as chaos tainted um obviously from our real world perspective we've got something where we can sit here and judge what lies in there with a different eye because we can go well that one's clearly a fantasy monster and that one's clearly well just a monster a real yeah. world creature that exists <laughs> in the real world. So from our perspective, it's super easy, but from theirs, it isn't. And that single line suggests that there is, in fact, a dividing line. Now, you could argue lots of other things, like, for example, that the lions, in this case, our great celestial lions, our winged creatures such as they are, were, in fact, deep in chaos and were properly twisted and weird and were quite different than some of the other monstrous creatures that are out there. And they were cleansed, mm. purified. You could do that easily. And indeed, um, given the amount of warp stone and other horrors that have lashed around those particular parts of the world, that is not a difficult argument to make. Equally, you could make um, other arguments saying that perhaps um, other creatures have been divinely, uh, say, cleansed. Um, that would be one way of putting it, particularly the great creatures of the High Elves. There are great phoenixes, for example, that are obviously very close to Azurin, the patron mm, deity yeah. of the elves. So perhaps they are no longer chaos or maybe never were. Maybe they're just etheric spirits that have somehow come to the real world because of the magical swirl around the annuli. There are lots of things that we can say that break it all up. And I think that that is probably the best answer that we can come with here. And that is that it's super complicated and there's lots of different versions of this. But I found this one tiny line mixed in amongst all the rest of it to be one of the most fascinating of all the changes, or at least the suggestions, because it did give you that feeling that, well, wait a minute, what if they are all, in fact, just chaos-tainted to this day? And that is how they are at least perceived by creatures like the shape-shifting dragons, which definitely are normal. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and I, I just found the whole thing kind of fascinating, whilst admittedly also thinking it was probably just a throwaway line by the writer who dropped it down going, that sounds cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that creature's in the Chaos Army book done yeah. yeah uh yeah i i personally also really really i i love how kind of open-ended it is of that it it does it says enough where you go oh without clarifying which i think this is actually a good thing in this case of like just the idea of cleansing could like if you're looking at it from a cathay sympathetic point of view or like a propaganda point of view then of course obviously the celestial dragon emperor and his beneficence and incredible power could wipe the chaos out of a creature and make it you know this beautiful wonderful thing but if you look at it from a more neutral perspective it's a really it it kind of raises a couple of alarm bells that a you're dealing with an entity that's so powerful that he is changing what a species is into an image that he finds more likable which i like a lot because that reaches very high into a his own arrogance and b mm. kind of blurs that line between of is he a god like he he does not like gods but he sure acts like one for an entity that despises them so much yeah and let's just add as well the process that almost certainly occurred it would have been magic oh yeah absolutely. just take a moment to consider that what is magic we all know what magic is in the Warhammer world. So what are we going into a, a literal Moorcockian situation? I do like to reference Michael Moorcock at least once a week, where we're using <laughs> chaos against chaos, because ultimately that's what's potentially happening here. Chaos is being used to draw out the chaos, and that is in and of itself either kind of cool or super arrogant. And I think arrogant also works very well with the dragons in general, because they are immensely so even if they themselves are also of immense power that arrogance comes hand in hand with what they are 
Yep. And the last thing I'll say on this before we'll uh, move along to some other things is just that, like Andy said, th the other thing that's opens up that I really, really love is if you had a debate going on between like one of the dragon children and like an elf, for instance, who hears about this and they're having a conversation in like one of the cities in Grand Cathay, the idea of an elf saying like, oh, well, you know, how could you tell if a creature is chaos or, or what have you? And granted, the Celestial Dragon Emperor could counter by saying, because I was here before, like I know what existed before chaos showed up. And now everything that comes after, as far as I'm concerned, is a chaos creature, which would still be a very arrogant and not necessarily correct point of view, but yeah. would paint for a really interesting character. And I think my last point in this one is that it's very hard to actually parse what is being said about all these new additions because they are given almost in the God voice, as in this mm -hmm. is a piece of narrative that is true, but... As we, as we all know, the best narratives for the Warhammer world generally come from someone's perspective, so you can understand more about who is saying this. In this case, it's not the Celestial Dragon Emperor who is saying, this is what I've done. If it was, we could easily say, well, that's what he thinks. This is given a different term. This is given it very much a God view. This is what happened. And that mm. is always a tougher thing for us Lori peeps to come in afterwards and go, wow, okay, well, if that's the case then that actually has implications on the rest of the Warhammer world. Do you realize you've written that person who's done the writing here? You might have been better doing it in quotation marks with a scholar perhaps making commentary on it or explaining what these things are rather than using the God voice to say, it's definitely this. But, you know, it's for, in this case, a quick blog post. Which, and for all, it may have come directly from Games Workshop Studio or whatever. And Games Workshop <laughs> Studio, it, it, it very well may have just been a doc that's written yeah, from the you perspective get, you get three of the three sentences to explain what this is. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, uh, whilst um, I, I put a lot of weight onto this, there's also a certain amount of, you take it with a, a, a pinch of salt. Yeah. Uh, laughing out. Last stream was hilarious. Good <laughs> fun. I think Warhammer 3 would be better served with more narrative. I think that made Warhammer 2 stronger, even when I wish for more narrative elements. Uh, I agree. I mean, and that's what I love so much about Shadows of Change, which is something we'll kind of be talking about today, is that it has narrative even on the global campaign, which is something they've started to lean into. And it's a good thing. Um, you know, as much as I miss having the advisor as a focus of the, of the storyline, it's interesting to explore what these other factions are up to. Mandatis! Oh my gosh, dude. Thank you so much, as always. You're for the super thank you support. so much. That's so uh, for the Sorcerer Lord of Zinch Gnome, uh, would a book of... <laughs> So he asks, would a book of grudges taken from a fallen hold be a potent enough source of latent olgu to be used for a casting focus slash talisman, or would it be need to be activated slash empowered by being demon bound? Ooh, so man. What you really want to do is uh, dial down hard on theme if you're doing something like this, and I won't spend much time in it because obviously I know it's a bit of an aside from what we're talking about. And the theme of the dwarves is very much capturing magic, holding it, and being anti-magical loosely speaking so what you would want for something like a great book of grudges for all it is obviously at the heart at the center of all of the political thoughts and experiences of the dwarf species and thus is absolutely redolent with algu it'll be trapped it'll be stuck it won't be moving anywhere it's bloody dwarves it's basically turned into an algu fortress it ain't coming out under any normal circumstances which means yes i would suggest it would need to be activated or empowered or in somehow used to turn it into a twisted artifact into something that it was never originally intended to be so i would look to try and take it a step further further away from what it originally was, which would in and of itself be a super fun story. What could it take to great take one of the greatest book of grudges and turn it into something bad? There you go. Um, and also, if you want good ideas for what might it take to do that, go read the Skarsnick novel, because that story uh, that story features a twisted dwarven artifact. Uh, 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 Elef Elephus Chaos. Elephus Chaos, yes. Uh, here's a couple of Bob. Thank you. Hey, <laughs> can I go on with a few, Bob? Hugely appreciated. Oh, uh, you, you, Hammond, I think you, you missed one there. Just bring up oh, that yes. one in the in between. Uh, oh, uh, boy. Is chaos a singular thing or is it a collection of magics? If the latter, then what magic can change, it can change again. Uh, so to answer those in order, yes, 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 and yes. <laughs> <laughs> Fair. <laughs> what would be the answer? Thanks, uh, Mornington. Eagle? Ka! Griffin, leave me be peasant you are beneath me. Your masters are hobo elves. My masters are noble Reichlanders. 
car. Well, as, as it actually turned out, it was almost the exact opposite. It was yeah. almost like the arrival in Ulthuin had awoken the Griffin. Um, and the Eagles were very much, yeah, you're coming with us. And the Griffin was very much, what the fuck? Um, <laughs> which was kind of super fun. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. E Gri a lot of people like Great Eagles may not be like the top of the roster, but like from a lore perspective, they are like no. They're very inspired by Tolkien's Eagles. They're very noble, um, very intelligent. They're mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. super fun. Uh, and also, thank you much to the all the gift subs over on Twitch for uh, Andy's uh, Twitch channel as well. Thank you for the support there, that guys. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, we talked about Celestial Lion. Let's yep, get yep. into the Moonbird, which has some really cool stuff. Like this. Uh, so the Moonbirds, uh, as much as they are, you know, very heavily inspired by a lot of the concepts of like the Arcane Phoenixes in game, from a lore perspective, they're very, very different. Uh, and this one I actually like because this is one of the creatures where they, despite it using a god narrative voice, it very implicitly includes like rumors and myths about the creature instead of just flat out yeah. saying some facts, which is fun because th that gives it's... us stuff to speculate about and have a good time with. So mm -hmm. what they talk about with the moon birds is the God voice kind of informs that for the most part, they're from the celestial mountains um, or the mountains of heaven and the mountains of heaven. Uh, we've spoken about in some prior streams are like the biggins. They are the Himalayas of the Warhammer fantasy world. Uh, at least according to the more modern sources of, no. Oh, Oh, here, 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 here. Oh, did we forget I, something? I, I, I got something wrong. Oh. So I'm going to immediately call it out, because if I get something wrong, I'm first put my hand up. <laughs> the description of the Celestial Lion is in quotation marks. Hmm. I missed that completely. So I'm going to put my hand up and say everything that I just said previously, I'm now going to reinforce whether they did the right thing. That's awesome. Good job. So good. Good. That means it is speculation. Awesome. That's, the, Perfect. that's what we like to see. All right. Yeah, me too. Uh, I believe the Moonbird is the same, which is why it uses yeah. it kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. Hy hypothesizes. So the that's Moonbird. That's what made me go down and check. Excellent. So the Moonbird talks about that uh, they are they make nests up in the mountains of heaven, uh, which means they're way up there. They're as high as you could possibly get, which makes sense in that they are creatures that seem very, very strong in affinity to the Moon Empress and Manslib in general. Uh, which is very exciting. There's actually a fair amount of lore that doesn't get as much focused about, about there are creatures that are naturally attuned to the different moons, where a lot of the more pure, I guess, if you want to say creatures, uh, are attuned to Manslib, and many of their kind of darker compatriots are attuned to, instead to Morslib. Mm -hmm. um, and in this case, we have a, a bird that are these... I, I, I'm not exactly sure what the species of bird they're based off of is. I've heard a couple of debates from various members of the community because uh, there are a series of birds from Chinese uh, fauna that they could be based on, but there's a lot there and I'm not super educated on that particular topic. But uh, A, their design is wonderful, even if they look a little bit like Toucan Sam. Uh, but B, the thing that's super fascinating about them is that they're able to conjure fl like silver flame. Mm -hmm which is super interesting if you know anything about the wider Warhammer world because there are other places that conjure silver flames that mm -hmm. burn away corruption. That is a very well-established concept within Warhammer Fantasy. And the idea that there are birds... And the thing that I like is they don't specify, if I recall correctly, uh, whether the flames are hot or cold. They just say that they're mm -hmm. flames that burn away corruption, which means it might not be a hot flame. It might be a cold flame. And if you know your empire lore, that should have your eyebrows going through the fucking ceiling. Yeah, absolutely. And it's also worth saying that uh, it was the very first thing that I thought when I first read it. I was like, oh, this is interesting. Big, huge moony bird. Who doesn't like a big moony bird? This is awesome. Oh, it comes from Mansleep. Awesome. Moonfire. Silver to the flames. What the? <laughs> Ooh. Now, uh, again, um, as we all know, I've been building my own version of the pawn in the background with um, one of our, my players in one of my games. Mm. And the moon, uh, <clears throat> let's say myths, are redolent in the East, not just in China, not just in Japan, but across the East oh, yeah, in every... a variety of mm. ways. Um, so I'd been working my way through some bits and pieces. I had not come up with anything close to a giant moon bird that flies down from the heavens and sits in moon mountains. That isn't where <laughs> we were. Um, but 
this tie into the wider Warhammer world that has clearly been opened up, even if they didn't intend it, is, I think, brilliant. Because one of the great things that you've got to uh, always remember when you're adding to Warhammer is that unlike the real world, and the real world, as much as some people might generally say that there's an underlying connecting point to everything, there kind of isn't culturally, other than what has been imported from one part of the world to another through cultural exchanges. Mm. Whereas in, in the Warhammer world, the winds of magic are real. The things that come from the moon, assuming they come from there, are real. All the bits and pieces that compose the Warhammer world are real and universal meaning that the same things that are popping up in the east or popping up in the west or popping up in the south or popping up in the north are going to have the same underpinning constructions. And it's really nice to see things that even if they weren't intended to be linked can very easily be linked. The connections here to the possibility of bringing in Ulrich and connections because of the eternal flame of Ulrich inside the High Temple of Ulrich in Middenheim are not just strong, they're very strong. Particularly if you go to much of the broader lore where we start looking at things like the god Lupus that you may or may not heard of, but the god hmm. Lupus um, was in the past said to have completely taken, been taken over his cult by the cult of Ulrich. Lupus was originally the god of Hochland um, and he was a god that was directly tied to the moon and wolves because they howled at the moon and there was also that loose idea that the children of Ulrich may originally have been tied to a completely different province over in Hochland at that point. Um, but the idea that we've got the moon connection, the wolf and the moon connection, this burning fire, the moon fire, it's not just strong links, they are all incredibly tight chains that almost bind this new piece of Cathayan background to one of the oldest pieces of Warhammer background that there is. Particularly given as well, as I recall, I think they mentioned the Cliffs of Shargon here, maybe? Or was uh, it the other one? Uh, uh, it might be in the, the other one. That's for the Frostworm yeah. later. That's for the Frostworm, yeah. Cliffs of yeah. Shargon from the Frostworm later. Of course it is, because that's Kislev. Um, But yeah, totally tied through to some of the uh, oldest lore that there is. And for me, that is super exciting, because... It means that if we're ever using these lures in our own games, we can make everything connect together in a way that Games Workshop most likely will never do. But all of those open doors are there before us to use as we wish. Yeah, and I, I'll say that one of the things that I love about this that I, I, would, it's, I would agree with Andy is probably not intended, but the door is <laughs> left ajar enough that like if you start pushing, you can go, oh, there might be some really cool stuff here that you could explore in your own stories and narratives and can help bridge the world that a games workshop was smart they would is like considering how critically important the flame of ulrich is to the entire setting because it's yeah. it's like the nexus point of the end times essentially is. is the flame of ulrich the idea that there would be a counterpart on the other side of the world in the far east makes a lot of sense like it is a force that because it is so potent you would expect to find it in other places that Oryx's power isn't just from himself. There's something more fundamental about it. There's something more core that it maybe existed before chaos or is representative of like a different idea. So now you have this opening of, oh, well, no, there's a deeper connection to man's lip, which is like, oh, that's a super cool concept. And you can lean into that very heavily, whether you're looking at like the children of Ulrich, if you're wanting to explore uh, the supposed blessed Ulrich who can turn into wolves and might have some kind of relationship with man's yeah. lip due to their transformation or and go, running with that of like the moon empress being from the moon and this this these people that used to live there and they're shapeshifters just mm -hmm. like the children of Ulrich are shapeshifters and, and it's, it's like so good <laughs> yeah yeah exactly and i feel exactly the same way it's something that just makes you get a bit giddy with excitement because whether they intended it to or not they have created such brilliant links and chains binding everything together to make sense of the Warhammer world as a whole that if they should ever return to Ulrich and go in depth and to try and position that god in a slightly different way, they have loads of great ideas that they can draw upon that ties the Empire all the way through to Cathay and builds bridges between each of their various factions in a way that previously wasn't there. It makes it feel like it's all part of one big background rather than the, I created this random crap over here and this random crap over there just because I could. Um, it makes it all feel like it's one part of a bigger piece of whole. Yeah, and the other thing that's super fun is that while the people of Cathay, as the quote implies, know that Moonbirds can be found in the Mountains of Heaven, it talks about that they believe that they nest in the craters on Manslib, 
yeah. which implies that you have things like astromancers and other people, um, astrologists uh, and uh, astronomers who are studying the stars, studying the moon and believing that, oh, well, these creatures, they clearly have this relationship with Manslib. They clearly have this relationship with the moon empress. They, they call, they arrive when the moon empress summons them and calls them. They seem to be her sacred creature uh, where they are kind of her, like her preferred creatures, which we see that she has a strong affinity for birds. Uh, between the Onyx Crowmen and the Great Moonbirds, yeah. there is a very powerful bird theme going on with the Moon Empress, which, if you know about your Zinch lore, is also very interesting, where you have this mysterious, shape-shifting goddess who nobody knows what her true form is, and she has a very strong affinity with birds and magic, which is very, very interesting. <laughs> so many fun tales that can be told with those, um, and we can only hope that some of them get de delved into. Yeah, so, uh, but that's pretty much all there is to say on those particular uh, two creatures, but they're they're fascinating, of that you have these celestial lions, which of course are very strongly uh, paired with Dad, of uh, the Celestial Dragon Emperor, and then the Moonbirds, uh, who can also be summoned by Astromancers, which is very, very cool. Like, they're so strongly... Uh, I, the thing I love, the last thing I'll say on this, and then we'll move on, is that I love that this takes that Silver Flame concept, but it ties it very strongly where Cathay has almost interpreted the Silver Flame to instead be a expression of Azir, whereas in the West, they see it as an interpretation of Gur, which you could do some very fun storytelling with of, is that because that's their natural affinity, or does it also have to do with perspective uh, of how mm. those cultures interact with those various sources of magic? Or or even how magic is understood, because as we all know, it's a complicated thing, and the eight winds as is understood is not necessarily the whole story. Mm. Go check our Winds of Magic stream about that one, because it is a far more complicated affair than you might first realize. Yep. Uh, Jonathan Scott, one missed opportunity is that we didn't get animated snowmen from Mother Ostankia. <laughs> Turning in innocent things into killing machines is great for horror. I <laughs> that would have been great, but honestly, I I just can't see them making one that wouldn't have people just laughing at it. To be yeah. totally honest with you, <laughs> there's a fine line between horror and humor, and sometimes the horror makes the humor, pardon me, makes the horror more horrific. Um, but if you are in, instilling horror into something you want to be horrific, you're often best doing it outside of the thing you're trying to make appear horrific. So animating your snowmen would probably be better outside of the force that you're trying to make look super scary. So that would then make the thing that comes along that's super scary be the, oh no, the bad thing's occurring. And that's really amusing, but not necessarily super scary. It's fair to say that Mother Stanky has taken the hags in a more, uh, more, less mischievous direction where many of the hags were very mischievous to begin with. They, I would not say Mother Stanky is by nature mischievous. Yeah, her, her personally at least. Yeah, no. no. Um, uh, Sin, which we will definitely be delving into her in a little bit. We uh, the Sitch Master, be. the flame of Ulrich is just moon bird barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> no! <laughs> Follow your nose! Yeah. <laughs> he shouldn't have. Uh, Hieronymus, hot take. The Great Maul wasn't created by a Warpstone Comet, but from a big frozen moonbird poop from outer space. You figured it out. And yep. if you want to know more about how much he's figured out, check our Great Maul stream. I can't <laughs> believe I'm just adding for all of our hey, previous hey, hey, it works. <laughs> it works. <laughs> um, uh, is the Flame of Ulrich just a moonberg egg? So A, that's a joke. But B, if you wanted to run a really interesting mystery, the idea that maybe there's an egg discovered deep within the Fauschlag rock, that might be connected to Silver Flame, and maybe it could have something to do with a moon bird, and it's just been waiting all this time, maybe for Moonlight to touch it or something. That could be a really fun story. Yeah, I, I would, um, if you're looking to utilize that, there are many different ways that you could refashion what these things are by giving a source for the flame, the source for the uh, magical energies that are spilling through the Fauschlag, the Ulrichsberg, the good old you know Middenheim stone. And a random thing that just occurred to me is that I love, I, once again, I don't think this was intended at all, but I love the idea that where Morselib kind of vomited Warpstone into existence, the idea that Manslib had its own counter being this silver flame that could potentially mm -hmm. be its opposite, I love that idea a lot. There could definitely be something in that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good morning, everyone. What evidence do we have that Yuan Bo is actually a fish man in disguise? Well, he's got scales, so I, I would say... Guaranteed. You know, mystery solved. Mystery Buy solved. Buy a foot. 
you figured it all out. What would we do without you? <laughs> uh, Ulrich did get around. Perhaps the Moon Empress is an old fling. I Wouldn't don't hate me. that idea. I, I, I don't, hate, don't hate that idea. As ridiculous as this is to say, Ulrich did get around. Um, One of the things that was repeatedly dropped down when we were writing the Ulrich material is to show just how much that god made some significant errors um, of judgment. That also made some good errors of judgment, um, but made many errors of judgment, <laughs> um, meaning that he was constantly getting into messes that he probably shouldn't have been. One of the Ulrich and basic tenets, their basic creeds, is the best lesson is the lesson you survived. And Ulrich survived a lot. So the idea that Ulrich got around and she might have been an old fling, perhaps neither of them really should have done that, would make for, I think, a super fun story and arguably an interesting side for perhaps some weird jealousies of a dragon who hates gods. Oh, yeah, that, that would actually be very interesting. You know, there, there's, always, uh, there's always nice to add personal elements to these things. Uh, the moon embers and birds. I told you guys she was the changeling running around seducing dragons for fun. H hey, have you ever seen her and the changeling in the same room together? I haven't. <laughs> I mean, what else can you say? <laughs> Zine just playing Octodad in Cathay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> wait, the Empress is an old flame of Ulrich, is why the Emperor <laughs> had that. Yeah, there, there you go. He got cucked by Ulrich. Seems like Shinzu is a bit of a mom. God damn it. I, I thought I'd come up with something clever there. You I can't know, believe Hammond beat in the us chat. to it. <laughs> <laughs> Disappointing. Well done, Hammond. Yeah, I agree. Um, <clears throat> is it? Is uh, it? Yeah. Uh, just a reminder that you both are incredibly awesome. Also, Aww. Archeon rules. Well, thank you. And yeah, I do love me some Archeon. Archeon rules the shattered remnants of once a mighty place. Hey, Mandatis, good to see you again. Andy, you may gain a new cross-cultural spiritual familiar. I, after the last familiar, I don't know if I can emotionally take a new one. I'm going to be honest. <laughs> As a viewer. <laughs> you might be onto something. Oh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> you may know <laughs> <laughs> um right so that was fun what we're we gonna go on to next because um uh, well, we got we got one more the first two have been a bit spicy quite enjoyed them uh <laughs> hey guys good to catch you again nice to listen to you guys my other while i stream total war three awesome appreciate it hope you're enjoying it oops i <laughs> did it again <laughs> uh, played with your heart hey hey yeah absolutely um Oh, okay. Last I one. mean, All right. who seduced whom? <laughs> I mean, where do you begin? I like how, I like how Chat's just running with the changeling. Up. He's not playing tricks. He's just sleeping around constantly <laughs> with tricks sometimes coming up amidst. Yeah, totally. Uh, what if Telcos were to trade in his phoenix for a moonbird? Would that make Sotek hate it less? Oh, Teclas. I, I, I still, I just don't like Teclas on Monstrous Mounts. I'm going to be honest. Listen, it's, it's not about like the affinity techless might have for the creature it's taking a character who the concept is that he's physically weak and mm -hmm. making him no longer physically weak you're stripping away a flaw of the character which is bad you shouldn't do and, that and ultimately when you're dealing with techless you very much want to reinforce where his strength is as well and his strength lies in magic so if anyone should be using magic to get around the battlefield it should be techless he doesn't need a big bernie bird he's bloody techless the high lore master of safri and i think i completely agree you're better trying to reinforce the characteristics of your character rather than have someone who's physically weak tied into the thing as he half dangles off going i'm not sure i think this was a good idea <laughs> um because it's really not the best place for someone like techless to be yeah and like funny though <laughs> and yet you have to think about it if you're gonna be riding a monster into battle you've got to have good like stamina you've got to be yeah. physically fit and that's just not techless <laughs> uh lador the rumor that the moonbird still lives on manslip could also mean there are things living on morslip and i would love that go check out our morslip stream we actually mm -hmm. talk a lot about that very concept because there are things on Morslib. That's and it, the spooky part. <laughs> it's also at the very core of what I'm building for Nippon as well. So it, it's something that I completely agree with. I think there's a lot on that. Yep. Uh, all right. So the last thing we need to talk about with the new Cathay stuff before we'll hop into some of the other things is, of course, the big construct character, Seitang hey, the Watcher. Uh, Seitang. So Seitang gives a good opportunity to delve back into the Terracotta Sentinels, which have been getting more and more lore. Uh, if you go check out our second... Um, old world stream so the old wow, world part two uh which was on uh my channel you should watch all three of them uh but mm -hmm, if you go mm -hmm. watch the second one we touched on Cathay. actually 
you want to watch the first and the second one because it came up mostly in the timeline section. Yeah, it did. Um, we talked a lot about how the Terracotta Sentinels are pretty fascinating constructs, and like the Great Bastion itself, they are big, um, obviously made of terracotta uh, entities that are empowered by magic by the Celestial Dragon Emperor to become kind of functionally alive. Uh, they're able to be animated and move around. But with Seitang, we have a unique situation where Seitang, uh, according to some um, uh, the various lore that's written about him and some notes in the game and stuff, was something created specifically by the Celestial Dragon Emperor himself. Uh, this was like one of his prized creations. And one thing that we see on the map that Grand Games Workshop released about Grand Cathay is that there's two of these guys. There's Seitang and Yang Sing, which uh, we don't know about the other one yet, but the fact that there's only two of them and they're so big and they're so powerful that they're notated on the map of the nation implies that these are big, important guys. Yeah, I particularly like as well that um, it's specifically called out that they're made of stone as well. Slightly different to the whole terracotta ones. They're proper yeah. old stone. Um, uh, the whole thing has got quite a different look. Really love how it looks. Um, and uh, the whole, you know, flitting around from mountaintop to it's mountain a top. Yeah. <laughs> or being a Gundam. Um, no other way of putting it. It looks like a freaking Gundam as well. I'm looking at the picture right now on my screen. You might be able yeah. to see it in my reflection. Yeah, just, just I've got a reflection. Just, area. <laughs> yeah, just where is that about yeah. there? Um, yeah. so yeah, I'm, I'm looking at it right now, and it could not be more Gundam if it tried. And I'll, I'll admit, when I first saw this, because I when I very first saw it, it was pinged over to me by the lore master over there. I first saw it, I went, God damn it. Because I was just in the process of building <laughs> something similar, and their one was so similar that I've had to ditch the idea, not oh. use it anymore, because oh. I'm doing something a bit different. Um, because it felt to me more of a Japanese slanted idea rather than necessarily a Chinese slanted idea, and it felt like a mixture of cultures there. Nevertheless, I freaking love it. Yeah, and I I will say this is such a cool mm. creature to put where they put him, where he he hangs out in the mountains of heaven, and mm. like Andy said, he literally. Is he does the Superman leaps tall mountains in a single bound uh, type thing? Where uh, the fun thing about him when you read his lore is that he can't actually fly. Like he has those wings, which he uses a lot in combat, has some cool animations. Uh, but he bounds from mountain to mountain top, shooting things. And what's fascinating about this is this really, although once again this isn't the intent of the article, it's really setting up a lot of interesting lore for what exactly is he protecting them against. Yeah. From because for those unaware, the mountains of heaven basically are kind of the border between Grand Cathay and uh, the kingdoms of end, as well as covering uh, the lands occupied by the Naga of Koresh, which implies that there are some really spooky giant fucking things that are that was... trying to come into Grand Cathay. But this guy, along with his brother, uh, I think Yang Sing, who's up guarding the northern border, they are used as these ultimate protectors that are meant to keep big, big, nasty things out, which is a very funny bit of, uh, fun bit of lore building, especially because they talk about, uh, if you go read the article on Tang, that he's known best by the people of the South. I'm just bringing uh, the comment up because it means... Mean, <laughs> <laughs> roll out! Roll out! Transformation <laughs> noises. <laughs> I but, freaking love that. <laughs> uh, but, like, uh, especially if you consider, like, uh, the Cubicle 7, um, this is a kind of a bit of an aside, but Cubicle 7 released their uh, Imperial Zoo book, and one of the big retcons, which, granted, these books, you know, have to be approved, um, one of the big things they note in that book is that there's a lore tidbit by one of the characters who talks about that the Dreadmaws are believed to have been created by the Naga of Koresh, that they use some kind of horrible sorcery and science to make these terrifying living monsters to keep people out. Um, to kind of act as border guardians almost. So it makes sense that you would have Seitang if the Naga are unleashing these giant horrors mm. sitting up on mountains going Poo! to shoot them from a long distance because the regular people of Cathay will struggle to stop these kinds of monstrosities. What I find particularly interesting is the fact that it is long range because typically when you are going for long range options, that's because coming into close range is too dangerous. So what the fuck is too dangerous to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with that thing? Why would you make hmm. that thing, okay, use what is effectively a less reliable weapon? Something that big is almost indestructible. Surely wading in and just stomping around would be much more effective than shooting from half a mile away. The answer to that is no. 
shooting from half a mile away, preferably further, is the better option because presumably getting closer is really stupid. And I really like that, at least in terms of the possibilities it offers, even if when they eventually execute it, they probably won't match our hopes and our possibly fears. Um, and <laughs> yeah, Quite. And it'll probably just be, a, oh, it's one of those. All right, fair enough. Okay, he's bounding around doing that. But at the moment, we have this possible pregnant situation where what's coming is so dangerous, you don't want to be close to it. And I really like that as a bit of storytelling. Yeah. And uh, I think the last thing I really want to say about uh, Satang that is um, uh, fun about him is that I also love that he really, really, uh, along with the original uh, constructs that we got with this DLC being like the Jade line and the Jet line and all this stuff. One of the things I really love about the Cathayan constructs is they've done a really good job of while they are constructs, just like the Tomb King constructs, they're very, very, very different where the Tomb King constructs are these much heavier, much bulkier, uh, not as tall generally, but they're they're like solid all the way through and they're heavy and they're designed to literally grapple enemy monsters and like throw them down and other stuff like that. But they're empowered by human souls uh, with the one exception of the Necro Sphinxes, which are nobody knows what they're powered by, which makes them very spooky, but it's implied that there are some nasty nasty gods behind it but with Cathay you have the Celestial Dragon Emperor is literally breathing magic into these constructs and with Satang especially when you look at him in game he's literally burning from the inside like he's got this golden flame burning through his face mask and his wings and everything which I, lo I love A that the Cathayan constructs you can literally see the magic pouring through them that's keeping them animated because they're, they're, they're hollow and B they're so much more agile and lithe. Like they're able to do far more complicated maneuvers. They're able to jump around and fight with far more finesse. Whereas the Tomb King constructs are far more almost about brute force yep. and using like horrible forms of venom and acid and fire. I love that despite the fact they have very similar concepts, they've taken them in two very unique directions, which is really good to see. Yeah, I, I could not agree more. Um, I won't belabor that point because I think it was very well made there. Um, and that's that trying to ensure that each of the factions have got their own tone, have got their own themes, have got their own ways of expression is super important so that everything doesn't muddy up and become like one. And here it has been enormously successful. My only concern, as I sort of hinted at before, was that when you move over and you hope that Games Workshop then make their own version of Nippon, that they will have already used certain ideas that are not just from both sides of that particular stretch of water, but perhaps from the other side, because there's been a certain merging of Eastern ideals there. And I would like to hope that uh, they don't accidentally cut their foots off there when yeah. it comes to making the next thing. Um, I don't think they will, because it's such a different place as well. So everything will manifest very differently again. But I do think it's something to cast our eye forward towards potentially being aware of. We all know why Cathay came first, because the Chinese market's huge um mm. i'm proper huge and everybody wanted total war to sell over there totally understand it but uh it does leave me with some gentle concerns with what it might do to nepal purely because they have done cafe so pretty damn well yeah i i do hope that whoever whoever was like actually leading the like let me sit down and kind of map out what we want to do with Cathay, they did a good job uh like yeah. whoever that person is uh or team of people more likely mm -hmm. um but uh yeah, it's funny. I, when Andy was saying that, I was like, oh, I have some ideas for Nippon, but then it occurred to me that that's on Andy's version of Nippon, not whatever GW's <laughs> version would be. And it's like, oh, wait, never mind. That's not helpful. Oh, yeah. Say. Completely different. Yeah. <laughs> that would be a totally different thing. Never mind. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, but Andy, maybe Seitang is an early cross cultural project. Uh, maybe. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> could be. Could be. Uh, and then I need Nippon to have uh, Skaven design level mech armor. Holy fuck yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It'll be there's a lot of things they could do with Nippon, which maybe one day for funsies we could do that as like a bonus stream one day of like a speculation stream. But um uh in any event, so I think that gets us kind of caught up on Cathay. Um we talked a yeah. lot about you on bow and all that because we did a stream about the Dragon Kids after you on bow was released. So you can go watch that if you want to catch up on a lot of those materials. So why don't we, uh, I think 
uh, why don't we go ahead and get into Kislev? Okay, because, here it comes. That's gonna, yeah, that's going to be the heavier one because then we can kind of finish mm. up with Zinch because we haven't really got to talk about Zinch that much. And yeah, there's more, and I do like kind of like bits. Yeah, so let's get into Kithay, uh, which or Kislev, which has some really, really interesting things. Mm. Um, I want to start with the easiest one first and then we'll get into the heavier topics that are interesting. Sounds so good. let's start with the Frostworm, um, mm. where the Frostworm is a very, very cool addition. Because for those who have never like really sat down and read the older lore on Kislev, whether you read like the old like Dogs of War book or the sixth edition um, Kislev book, um, or any of those uh, older articles, or a lot of the Realm of the Ice Queen, which Andy uh, himself worked on, Frostworms have been mentioned in Kislevite lore for a long time. Yep, um, they were always kind of these like nebulous in the background type creatures, but they were always mentioned. Um, they're very, very consistent. That was actually why when Norska originally came out, I kind of criticized the Frostworm being a Norskin chaos dragon that was just ice themed because it was, for me, it was a very disappointing interpretation of that creature because it tended to be more heavily associated with Kislev than the Norskins. Um, but here they went, all right, fuck it, let's fix it. <laughs> and they renamed the Norskin one to the the Fro Chaos Frost Dragon, or whatever the hell it's called now, uh, which is perfect. That works fine. Uh, and now we have the Genuine Frost Worm, which the Lord talks about are from the Mountains of Shungan? Shargan. Shargan. So the Mountains of Shargan are proper ancient in terms of Games Workshop lore. I reintroduced them because they were lost all the way back before 4th edition even existed. Way, way back deep into 3rd edition Warhammer. So we're talking before Warhammer Fantasy roleplay was even a thing. The Cliffs of Shargon oh, were God. first mentioned. In fact, I think it may even have been 2nd edition. We're talking super old. And when I was asked to do the map for Kislev when it was being updated, um, I went through every edition of the game and found every single last mention of anything to do with Kislev. And the Cliffs of Shargon were one of those. A barrier between some of the more nastier things that lay to the north and Kislev and Erengrad to the south. And I was like, yeah, holy crap, I'm including that. That got um, dropped in, and it got picked up again later when they did the, oh, one of the campaigns, Thousand Thrones, I think. They ended up dropping the Cliffs of Shargon as a primary place to go to. And that was fun. So they are an ancient location, which is super nice to see, have survived through to the end, because I dropped on every map that I could, because I like trying to make sure that the ancient stuff is recognized as much as the most recent things. Okay, it's nice to pull it all together. So if you ever get one of those old books and you're like, oh, wow, this is super crazy and weird. And then you find the words Cliffs of Shargon in there. You're like, holy shit, that's still in Warhammer. Because <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> there's no reason that it shouldn't be because it's got such a long legacy. Um, it's all the way from, as I say, Warhammer 3rd edition. So that's super cool. And seeing it written there into the most modern version of the background for me was super cool. I've also written in the past about Frostworms without describing what they were or what they could be. So seeing them manifest in what looks almost like a Cathayan dragon style um, is for me super fun. That big long worm um, yeah, I, rather I, than going and, for the uh, winged dragon. Quite like yeah, I, that. I, I love that they actually made it a worm too. Where like, mm. I, I know this isn't, the, you know, there's always the joke in fantasy communities how if you post a picture of a dragon and you have a bunch of fantasy nerds, they'll start arguing about what technical subspecies it is, even though every fantasy universe is different, where they're like, oh, well, it doesn't it, it doesn't have front legs, so it's a wyvern, or no, yeah, it doesn't yeah. have wings, so it's a worm, or like they have all these, there's all these technical obsessions people have focused on, that I love that they went with the worm design, but it's true in that it, you know, it doesn't fly, it just crawls, it slithers along the ground, uh, though in the game, it does have some, A, the animations are beautiful, but I love that uh, it literally uses its ice magic to slide, which if you've ever actually gone out into nature and you, uh, you're you watching like how some species hunt or move around in like frozen environments, there are creatures that will literally use like gravity and like belly slide really, really fast to get to something, um, which is really spooky when you see it. So the idea that the frost worms literally use the fact that they're kind of these living embodiments of frost magic to freeze the ground in front of them so they can slide towards you and they're slithering towards you like a big fucking snake and then you're not going to be able to run because the ground beneath you is turning to ice. A, that's fucking terrifying. And B, I love it. Like it is such a good design philosophy for this creature. 
they could have given them wings like easily but i'm really glad that they they don't fly that they're just these big serpentine like they have legs and can move very easily on them but they definitely seem to be a creature that primarily likes to hunt or move around by kind of undulating or slithering uh across ice or down slopes and stuff like that like i guess the, the thing i'm trying to say is that for when you think about what kind of environment they live in i love that their body reinforces what kind of evolutionary adaptations they would probably develop yeah i i I'm, again all i can do is agree i really like it i particularly like the little bit of concept art as well where it's freezing someone and the little person sitting there like that's good <laughs> Have you seen the meme? Uh, it just made seen, me laugh. <laughs> have you seen the meme about that image? So it's no, got, I haven't. It's got, the, it's got the ice witch on the back, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. From that image. So mm. someone added text that says the worst she could say is no. <laughs> so it's just some guy getting like blasted for asking out a ice witch. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> but uh, I will say, I also love that they they you know they narrow down that these are creatures that are very strongly affiliated with ice magic. Which once again, this kind of Something. seems to almost be very heavily reinforcing that ice magic is almost a wind in and of itself. To the yeah, extent so... that there are natural creatures that are deeply affiliated with it because they live in Kislev, which makes which makes sense. That that is how magic often works. Is that if a creature lives around strong amounts of magic for long enough they start to become kind of bound to it like the forest dragons of ethel lauren for instance yeah so um th this is just a fascinating for thing for me in general because it's something that i wrote about and uh had big long conversations about behind the scenes as well particularly with ice magic and exactly what it is and isn't and how it should be expressed inside a book if you're writing about it and uh, for me I love this because it reinforces everything that I wanted to write, but sort of couldn't um, uh, because Games Workshop at the point when I was writing really did not want to confirm what ice magic was or wasn't. We're more than happy for the background at that point to clearly state that ice magic welled up from Kislev, that there was perhaps a source that it was welling up from that was indeed called at that point in the background Kislev or Mother Kislev or the motherland um and it froze most of kislev and there was all manner of creatures and spirits there that were attached to it but they did not want those creatures and spirits to be specifically attached to ice magic or anything close to a wind of magic because they wanted to keep that differentiation from the winds of magic where from my perspective where i was attempting to write it from the i from someone who was in world they would not be able to differentiate between the cold icy flows swooping across let's say kislev and say though of more open flows of gyron that were making their way between some of the great stone circles of the empire for example mm. so it would be really tough and they would be classified particularly by local wizards as similar manifestations similar things so uh we had a name for the wind of magic that was the ice wind of magic um we had a whole variety of things written and prepared for it if games workshop wanted to have it and they said yes all of this is cool but we don't want these bits written about publicly we'll just keep it behind the scenes and then when we see this coming out and saying ice magic everything associated with it it's running through it just reinforces all of those tones and for me it's really good because again it mixes up exactly what the warhammer world can be and shows it's a far bigger more complex thing than simply the elves who are attempting to teach the empire which is the focus that we always get for magic it's rarely mm. what the elves actually think it's what the elves told the empire it was. So there's always been a level of, let's say, unreliable narrator in there. And this mixes it up big time because just on the border of the great center of all our knowledge of magic is something that deeply contradicts almost everything that has been said before. And I like that because yeah. extra extra bit detail. Yeah, and two things I want to kind of add on to what Andy was saying there is that first, the conversation is that A, the other thing I really like that Total War did is expanding the magic where it's the magic of the land which we know is ice magic and then as it shoots up into the atmosphere it becomes the magic of the tempest uh which is that oh. new lore of magic as well where mm -hmm. the two are very similar but the fact that like total war goes far as to say but they're actually different as they interact with different elements of like the environment is a awesome and b yeah. once again is very strongly reinforcing that it's something kind of welling up from the land itself and going mm -hmm. out and that it's its own unique thing. It's not just like, oh, we're mixing some lores together to create our own version. 
No, yeah. it's something that's natural to that area and can be drawn upon uh, once you know what it is and have a sense for it, perhaps in other places. And again, if you're looking to try and try your world together, this is clearly attached to the Eternal Flame in Middenheim. This is clearly attached to the moon fire that you get over in the east. All of these things are related if you wish them to be, or if you look at it and start going, wait a minute, it's all silvery, fiery, icy. Oh, oh, it's all the same thing, suggesting that there is definitely something more going on there. And I, for one, like that because it breaks up the very stratified and it is this way only type of magic that has been around between the third and maybe the eighth edition of Warhammer, but constantly undermined by every extra thing that they added to it, while simultaneously at the top they say, yeah, but there's just eight wins of magic. Yeah, and uh, the other thing I'll say is to kind of reinforce something Andy said earlier that's kind of popped in my head and I love, is that so <laughs> the the cliffs of... Uh, I forgot, Shargon. Oh, I forgot Shargon. Shargon. The cliffs of Shargon... The idea that the frost worms are native to there, A, is a very cool call to it from a real world perspective being so ancient, but it's so ancient that there are these primordial drakes, these primordial worms living and nesting in there, and that they they hibernate up there in the summers, and they come down in the winters, mm -hmm. which is awesome because that's a flip on what we normally see in Warhammer, where things yep. hibernate in the winter and then come out in summer. The frost worms are the opposite, which is very cool. And the thing I love about that is it reinforces so well why Kislev is so fucking hard to invade and is so dangerous for chaos, where the Cliffs of Shargon, once again, are acting as a literal barrier to the forces of chaos, where not only are they just a big pain in the ass mountain range they have to try and go around, but the fact that there are these big pissed off uh, dragons living there that as their little lore snippet says in the article, will literally come down and hunt chaos creatures when they're hungry, which is hilarious. But like, imagine how much scarier that makes where we have a lot of lore that talks about the forces of chaos will often attack in the spring because they're trying to spring avoid um, the winters because the winters are so harsh uh, where, you know, we have the legendary spring drives of Warhammer Fantasy, which is when chaos comes down. But this adds to that where it's not only that chaos it doesn't like the weather, it's also there are things in the blizzard. There are creatures that are hunting them if they stay too long in Kislev, which I love that. Like you could write a really cool short story or a little novel about like a chaos horde that stays too long and learns to their horror that it's not just the snow you have to worry about. There are things that are going to hunt you down. Particularly as well, because there's a site that's super important to Chaos, really close to there, called Shamon Derek or Chamon Darek, depending on how you want to pronounce it. And that's like an ancient site where Chaos would often camp over the winter to try and avoid the worst. So you could have that place be assaulted by the unexpected horrors of the winter. And just as one last little aside in the Cliffs of Shargon, for those of you who are lore hunters out there, Cliffs of Shargon also have one other super fun place. It is either A, the crash site of an old one vessel, <laughs> which is which is super fun, or B, the initial landing point of the old ones. So that as well adds a spicy little extra to what the frost worms could be. Yep, 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 yep. And what uh, they're protecting. Yeah, yeah. Like what's what's in those mountains? What's what? there? Yeah, so that's super fun. Yeah. Uh and uh real quick, I'm gonna get caught up on just some super chat stuff because there's been yep, quite yep, a yep. few that jumped in here. Where was the last one? No. Uh oh god, no. Oh wow, a whole bunch of them came in. Uh nope, still. Uh nope, <laughs> still. Okay, here we go. Uh Terran Con Sentinels are said to be an army created against chaos, but Satan's buffing the other constructs it also implies that he and his brother were general slash leaders of that army. Yeah, so Lidor, the best way to look at that, Lador, I think, is that uh, as opposed to them maybe being like generals in the sense of like, oh, they're like giving commands and issuing all these thoughts and stuff, that they're such there seems to be, have been so much additional magic poured into them to make them so much larger and more powerful that just their presence kind of takes the other ones up to like maximum power could be one way to look at it. Now, you could also look at it in the sense that they are quite literally giving direction uh, to their fellow constructs because as we know, Satan doesn't have a mouth. Uh, he doesn't seem to talk. Uh, if you just click on him in the game and stuff, he just makes terracotta sentinel noises. Um, so, But it could be they have their own form of psychic connection or any other uh, number of things. But uh, yes, they definitely were designed to be the main core around which the Sentinels often probably fought against some big bad chaos words. 
Um, something that's actually worth noting about Satang that I forgot to mention until just you said that is that one of the things that's cool is that the map we have of Grand Cathay from Games Workshop that shows Satang on the map is during the crisis of the old world. So it's during the age of darkness and disharmony in Grand Cathay. And because of that, uh, Satang is in the middle of Cathay. He's not, he's not in the mountains of heaven. He's like way over in central Cathay, which opens up the, the, the concern of what the hell is going on that he is hundreds of miles away from where he's supposed to be, uh, which is really fun to think about. It is. Uh, Aaron Rodgers, the Nagas perhaps have corrupting blood magics. That being uh, close to is a horrible time for any entity, which almost implies containment, implies a very corrupting entity insiders in, uh, in Koresh. Yeah, I mean, it also suggests that very possibly the corruption is corruption of a different type in that if you get too close, you might switch sides. Um, there's a yeah. lot of different ways that this could be manifested. It doesn't just need to be it's something that is awful to actually get into close combat with it, or perhaps causes you to dissolve or something equally horrible. It could simply be that the closer you are to it, the more likely they are to try and take control of something that's magical as a basis, meaning that the most powerful thing that they can have is something that stays away and shoots from afar. There's lots of ways it could be interpreted. Yep, absolutely. Uh, Ryan Woodall, a bit off topic, but I had to ask, do you think both of the dragon emperor, the empress of the children, managed to survive the end times of the AOS. If so, do you think uh, both think we would see Shinzu and Shiyama? I would guess that from Games Workshop's perspective, at the moment, none of them survived, at least as far as we can currently tell. Um, it's it's really hard to say, especially with how Games Workshop is acting at the moment, which we'll talk about later, uh, as far as like some of the decisions they've made with a couple of concepts in the old world. Um, it, it's it's really hard to say. Uh, I would, if they did survive, though, I would honestly think that none of the dragon kids probably survived because they would want to take Cathay in a really unique direction to make their AOS version very unique. Um, they, but it's it's kind of impossible to say. Yeah. So, um, I think one thing that's relatively clear is that Age of Sigmar is not going to be Warhammer, and Warhammer is not going to be Age of Sigmar. Now, they may have characters that they share, they may have characters that they have in common, but these characters will almost certainly be changed from what they were into what they are now in the Age of Sigmar version. So if they were to continue on and move into the next step, shall we say, they would almost certainly manifest in a very different way to how we see them today, just to keep the two settings nicely discreet because there's quite clearly a desire to do that even though if we we're to look at the 40k equivalents there's no great worry about having one of say the primarchs pop up over there and be any different to what he was all the way back in the 30k era he's the same bloke doing the same bloke stuff and probably carrying the same blokey weapons also being 40k bloke 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 <laughs> Where if we look here um, there seems to be a far more almost, there seems to be not just a desire, there seems to be almost an, a, a desperate desire to somehow keep them separate while simultaneously going, yes, it's the world that was and they're the same. So I don't think it will happen purely because it's almost a Warhammer property just now that has yet to land in the Warhammer world. That will likely happen first, I would presume. And then if it proves to be enormously popular, they might go, yeah, you know what? We want some of that over Age of Sigmar way. How can we incorporate it? And it really wouldn't surprise me if it was incorporated in a very different way. But if they do do that, they will have one question to answer is, what the hell did they do in the end times? I sense a lot of retconning coming to try and make them not look so rubbish. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Hobnoblin, could Satang have some amount of the Dragon Emperor's personal essence? It would explain why he's special and that there are only two of them. We know the Celestial... Uh, it, <laughs> CSE makes me think that Celestial Space Emperor <laughs> instead of Celestial Dragon Emperor has used his own fang to forge you on both sword. I would say yes, if, emphatically. Yeah. The Celestial Dragon Emperor seems to have a very strong theme for if there's something really important to him, he quite literally pours himself into it, like he did with the Great Bastion, um, which is why uh, one of the really interesting things is that the def the defense of Grand Cathay seems very much tied to his personal life, yeah. um, where if for some reason all of these things were destroyed, he could very realistically die, um, which is very interesting, uh, but also kind of shows his commitment uh, to protecting Grand Cathay, which is very and interesting. Also 
and also perhaps shows is both desperation and arrogance, depending upon how you want to look at it. I think there's a That's lot true. of really cool mm. stories that just haven't been told there because it's, in terms of the overall Warhammer world, a super new faction that's very likely going to be constantly skipped as the years go by with perhaps just a single book or two being added for it. Um, I'm... I'm afraid that the bigger stories like these may never really be told for a good 10 years yet because they've got so much consolidation to do to get the army into place, to get everything sorted, to start off dribbling out perhaps a novel or two for over there. And they will all be low key, almost certainly not dealing with the bigger characters. It'll be, what's it like to live in Cathay as we deal with somebody moving across Cathay doing Cathay and stuff. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure this is something we'll have an answer for for a long time, but the answer is for the core part, yes. Yep. Uh, Soldier, do we think there's a chance we'll still see frost fiends like Bargeist or does the frost worm replace them? Is there a chance? Sure. Yeah, uh, sure. It, is it definitely going to happen? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> it, it, I have no idea. I have no idea if Kislev is going to get more DLCs or if they're done. I, I could not tell you because the problem is we don't have a fancy army book that we can go, look, here's all the playable units. They will do all these things. Games Workshop has changed a lot about them. Uh, yeah, which, absolutely. which we're about to get into in a minute. So yeah, I mean, the, the, to cut a long story short, Kislev has changed massively multiple times. And the Frost Fiends have landed in more than one place over that time. Um, when I was writing, say, the Kislev book, um, in there, the Frost Fiends were very much a spirit. Um, they were a spirit that you would find in the Oblast, almost like a, a whirlwind of claws and ice and magic and horror um, that the Ice Witches could summon and take the form of, if they wish, form of the Frost Fiend is one of their spells. And that came all the way back from Warhammer 4th edition. It was the step from there into the more modern version. But you'll find that as they consolidate their new version of um, Kislev and add more and more detail, things like that often just get pushed to the wayside until later, once everything's built and they go, what new thing can we add? And they start looking back to the old stuff that previously they'd overwritten. They say, oh, we could just add that. And you see, suddenly find things that we thought were discarded, I don't know, zote their way back into our background material <laughs> again, yeah. and Fibber start marching down the hills as everyone goes, where the heck did they come from? Yeah. So nothing is ever lost while simultaneously everything is open to change and we never know when they'll come back. Yep. Uh, to market to Japan, Nippon will be the waifu army. You know, it's funny. One of the things <laughs> that um, is so interesting about Japanese mythology and modern culture especially is that Japan's really good at melding cute with, like, horror, horror. Uh, uh, which would be very fun to explore for Warhammer Fantasy, where you have things that might look adorable, but in fact are, like, nightmarishly dangerous. So that is the description of one of the characters that we've created for our version of the pawn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is it. Um, and uh, <laughs> a character as old as the Cataclysm. Um, and it's a proper nasty one. So for our version of the pawn, we've built an entire Warhammer army list, an entire total war army list, um, an entire breakdown of what it could be. Because if you build those, you almost understand what was then created to make those make sense when you're building the communities. So we've done all that. And I... I don't disagree with your core part, but much more Warhammery than just a simple waifu. Yep. Uh, idea for Kislev Melee Hero. I mean, th there there are a lot of things you could do with, like, just take a boyar, but make them smaller <laughs> and use an um, uh, uh, appropriate name. Like, they could do something more exciting, but the, yeah, Warhammer, the Warhammer strategy tends to be take your lord and make him a hero version. Yeah, there's an actual uh, term um, in Kislev for a blade master. Um, so this is someone who is better at doing melee combat than anyone else. Think of it like the equivalent of um, hitting your top rank in some martial art. Um, Kislev has got his own form of close combat martial arts, um, and they've got a term for their blade masters. And their blade masters, it pops up in a bunch of the novels, it pops up inside some of the old roleplay games. So yes, there's definitely a space for that if they decide to do it. I don't suppose you remember. No, off the top of my head, but oh, I yeah, can yeah. get it. I can get it pretty fast while you're looking at the other questions. Sure, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Um, uh, Nitantuel, thank you so much for the super chat. As a Slavic person myself, I'd love to see the chicken hut in game. One GW8 full of nobody. It's still Baba Yaga. Two Warhammer Worlds. Chuck full of IRL references. The fact that they draw the line chicken hut is ridiculous. So, uh, me and Andy talked a lot about the chicken hut controversy back in our uh, Hags of Kislev Lorebeards oh, yeah. episode. If you want to go back to that. We respectfully would disagree um, only for the sense that Warhammer tends to be, at least in our opinion, uh, hopefully Andy's cool with me saying this if he wants to add an addendum, he can, of that it's great to be inspired by things in the real world, 
but you should try to avoid making one-to-one references where possible because it kind of comes with like additional baggage and or it doesn't fit the universe as well as it could because you're striving to just like copy paste something instead of interpreting something. Mm-hmm. Um, but like a little kind of behind the, behind the scenes thing I can tell you is that there was originally a chicken hut for Mother Ostankia, not like a playable one, but like I think it was like the original icon for her her hut, um, her little hut mechanic had a chicken hut iconography to it. Um, and so did her like landmark building that you can find in, uh, I think her starting settlement. But those got explicitly changed and removed because of Games Workshop being like, nah, we don't like it. Like they just, they just didn't want it. Which yeah, I, I ultimately no. think is, because the thing is, is you don't want to look at Mother Ostankia and see everything about Baba Yaga and go, oh, well, it's Baba Yaga. And assume that everything that's true about Baba Yaga is true about Mother Ostankia. Um, because they're not the same character. They're very different characters. Um, and that's that's good, honestly, I think. I, I think you you want to try and avoid one-to-ones as much as you can. That being said, if you're ever, like, thinking about Mother Ostankia, like, you know, she still does kind of similar things. Like, if you watch her in-game, she has all these animations where, like, you know, spider ethereal spider legs come out of her out of her sled and like impale people and rip people apart. Now that's freaking cool. Yeah. Yeah. So So, what you want to be is inspired by not copying. Yeah. So the idea that Mother Estankia's hut, hey, we know it moves. Uh, Like, well, we're going to talk about the short story from David Geimer in a little bit. In the short story, it flat out talks about that Mother Estankia's hut moves. It's not in the same place um, day to day. It moves around. Now, it's not said how it moves around. So the idea that she casts magic in some kind of animal parts come out of it and move it around is perfectly viable um it's just that you know uh, to just be like oh well we want the exact same thing baba yaga had to make her more like baba yaga eh. uh generally speaking i don't think that's what you want to do um that um yeah. completely that um uh, just as my very pithy short version of that it shows a lack of imagination. The Warhammer world is better and bigger than that. Yeah, like I get it. Don't get me wrong. I get it. But yeah. uh, but there are reasons to avoid it. Uh, no, I... Viper Wolf. Um, I'd love a creature or spirit representing Daz. I feel like it really brings kisses into a new light. What? Am I... I feel like that took a really hard left turn. <laughs> <laughs> well, I say Daz. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, Viper, uh, I, uh, okay. Uh, Oh, brings Kislev into a new life. Ah! (laughs) Oh, Viper, that makes such a difference. Oh, man, I am not, like, there's something about Daz I am missing, but, I mean, good for him. Uh, that's super funny. Um, yeah, so, uh, Daz does have creatures that represent him. Uh, he has fire, like, uh, they're not, are they called firebirds? Um, yeah yeah the firebird of Dawes, they're not very big is kind of the only issue with them like they're quite small creatures um but uh would there be like f- fire-like entities representing Dawes or creatures that represent the sun yes absolutely they would exist um did games workshop put that in the roster oh yeah i definitely think it's something that could be done um one of the great joys of warhammer is that there's always another thing that somebody has written somewhere um now daz got a little bit of extra detail in realms of the ice queen because the original creation for daz all the way back in the what fifth edition army list fifth i think it was fifth um is it six i can never remember which one it is uh, I think it was um uh, whichever one it is the one that gav thought rule painting yeah, whatever. <laughs> um uh gav's one it had a little bit of detail in there very little else um, more was added in realms of the ice queen i wrote a bunch of extra spells for it um but the general oomph of the god was really dialed down and the general oomph for where it could all go was somewhat dialed down as well because it was being written for the fantasy roleplay game at a ground level rather than the top tier priests explode and draw the sun down from the sky type thing so the firebirds that are mentioned there 
um, which were, as I recall, somewhat amusingly referred to as fire chickens when they were getting. Yeah, they aid. literally like would come out of like campfires <laughs> and stuff. Yeah, because because they, they're re a representation of hospitality, so they were coming out of fires and gobbling up various things, gobble gobble gobble. Um, but they were certainly not the most impressive of creatures. If you were doing it for the Warhammer scale or Total War scale, you would be really dialing that up, a past your Phoenix level type area, and also using them as a counterpoint to the Great Frozen Ice, which is why ultimately you might not want to use them, because for all Daz is an important deity and represents many things in Kislev, when you're building yourself an army or a roster of unique troops, you want them to very much be on theme as much as possible. And fire, although it works very well with ice, would have to be carefully incorporated if you were going to incorporate it, because it undermines that core icy tone for the Kislev army. So as much as I think something like that would be fun, it would also potentially not be the best option for an army list. Yeah. Um, and great. There's a lot of things cool. you can do with Dawes. Like Dawes is of the Kislevite gods. He's heavily associated with civilization and like humans in general um, mm. compared to the other three. Uh, so like they could do maybe like a unit that has like enchantments of Dawes or uses some kind of weapons that are inspired by Dawes or something like that. That could be a fun thing to do. Um, like, Definitely. I don't know, maybe like a unit of, of like religious dudes that are wielding braziers or something. I don't know. Um, Mandates, there's a great mod that gives the hag mother a chicken leg house. Yes, there is an excellent mod that actually gives you the chicken uh, leg house as a like monster. So yeah, go enjoy that if you want. That, that's the best thing about mods. Just like real Warhammer yeah. lets you make your own cannon. And I think um, it's the perfect place for it. Yeah, Mandata asks, Andy, do you know the name of the Ice Wind? Yeah, um, well, I know the name that we used back then. It literally means nothing. It's basically fan work these days. Um, but it was Kishil, um, and it was effectively the Ice Wind of Magic. It's how it was referred to um, amongst the rest of the winds, like, you know, Gyron or any of the And just because I know they're going to ask, how do you spell it? I can't recall off the top of my head, but if you pop down and ask over in um, my Discord channel, I'll pop it in there because I've got the spelling in my old Magic document. There you go. So I can, I can just copy-paste it from there. <laughs> Shamana Dark. Yeah. Shamona. Yeah, Darek. I I can't I can't help it. It's actually Darek spelled D H A R E K as I recall. Yeah, I that's why like despite the fact I know it's Shaman, I almost uh, like I always have to say like Shaman <laughs> or like or Kama like I try and cuz it's so easy for my brain to go come on <laughs> every time I hear Shaman every time I fucking hear that. Um, it's that right guy. Why did the Ungols and the Hags fight the Gospodar and Ice Witches if they got all their powers and found the nation from the Ancient Widow? Why didn't the Ancient Widow give Ice Witches to the Ungols? Go watch our Hag stream. We cover so much of that. Like, so much of that. Um, and the answer is that, A, gods are kind of dicks, and they don't always do what you would think would be the most, like, sensible thing for them to do. Um, and you have to remember that from the Ungol perspective, the Gospodars were literally just invaders. Yeah. Um, and at least from where the primary stories of the invasion of Kislev comes from, as it's currently told and very well will be rewritten, um, the uh, not only were they invading the Gospodars, they were they were almost as much as you could call chaos warriors as you got. They came from the north. They came from across the steppe. Now, admittedly, they were bringing ice magic and they were coming to Kislev in many respects to free Kislev from their perspective, to free the ice magic from the shackles that they believed it was under. Um, and that was manifested through the great um, Urson, the great stones of Urson, where they eventually captured. Uh, but that lore is almost certain to change. Who knows what the new story is going to be? But if you want a good examination of the older story, go check our hag lore, because we did have a good chat about it. Yep. Uh, Love God, we're still missing ridiculously ripped shirtless Kissifites laying a WWE Smackdown on the enemies of Mother Kislev. Uh, they're there. You just you just have to imagine it in your heart. But uh, <laughs> but I, it is funny. They have kept mentions of uh, if you actually read the David Geimer short story, it does talk about that. They still have that in that there's still the Ursonite right is still canon of that. If you want to impress Urson, you're supposed to go hunt a bear and fight it with your bare hands. Like you, with your bare hands, bare, bare hands, yeah, <laughs> your bare hands, yeah. So yeah. you still have WWE Kislevites, uh, because Urson, <laughs> Urson demands he is a, he wants the SmackDown. <laughs> um, Sultor Frostworm equals Frozen Shard Dragon. I will say I would love to see a Shard Dragon for the dwarves. A lot of people are kind of eh on them. Um, eh. because, to be honest, they don't really fit the dwarves. Um, <laughs> they're an awesome expression of how powerful Rune Magic is, but my god, are they a random ass unit? Um, 
but you know, we'll see. CP4 and bummed that the form of the ancient widow are we born that bummed that the form of the ancient widow didn't make the cut. It seemed like most of the total war part of the lore hags. Uh, I guess it didn't work with the chariots. You know, I'll kind of sort of disagree with you. I think it did make it. They just edited it to uh, fit how the unit works now. Because you're right. We don't have the form of the ancient widow. We have the form of the ancient witch. Um, which is practically the same thing. Especially because the notes in the spell make it clear it's not referring to Ostankia. It's referring to something else. Something even older. Yeah, I mean, the uh, the Ancient Widow, as it was originally imagined, has clearly been gently massaged out. Um, so you'll find she's the still, language... She's still canonical. Uh, she is yeah. mentioned a few places. As I say, gently massaged yeah. out. Um, <laughs> I, it wouldn't surprise me by the time we reach uh, Warhammer Army List for Kislev, um, the references to the Ancient Widow in comparison to Kislev will be gone. Um, mm. And it will just be Mother Kislev. Um, or the motherland or some equivalent because you tend to find that the warhammer version of the various units and the various things that we have from fantasy roleplay are always simplified every single time it's never the case where they take the thing for the roleplay and they make it more complicated it pretty much never occurs um so the idea that kislev is seen as more than one thing that the hag's view of what kislev is very different to what the Ice Witch's view is, is something that is difficult to express in very few words inside an army list. They want to keep it nice and clean, nice and simple. They're all working together, don't you know, because they are Kislev. Um, so those distinctions, those cultural differences will almost certainly be gently, gently pushed aside. Yep. Uh, give us a Nepal lore video, Andy. We needs it. Yeah, I not to lot to finish the map. I'm uh, halfway through the rejig of the map that we're currently doing for it. We're doing it in the same style as the old world map because why not? It's super easy to do. Um, it's far easier than doing it in other styles. <laughs> <laughs> the, the old world map is beautiful for its simplicity in terms of how it's presented. So we're doing that, and I'm just doing the Nipponese um, islands part of it. Whatever that giant island is underneath it that was once Nippon, we're not touching at all, nor are we going to be touching um, any of Cathay in the slightest, just those islands. Um, but they're, they're now mapped. I've got the shapes in place. I'm just uh, organizing all my labels. So once that's all done, um, then once I finish my Warhammer army for it, pretty much done, and then my Total War army, which is half done, then we might do it. Excellent. Can't wait for that. Cue in tigers, lions, bears, and saber-toothed tigers. I feel like we missed the point. Yeah, that was yeah, 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 yeah. Granted, that one <laughs> was like 10 minutes ago. Uh, so the changeling was sm <laughs> smooching Dawes, too. She gets around. Man, that cha that changeling. changeling is just a little slut over there. Damn. Uh, uh, F autocorrect more than Twitch chat. Yep. Hey, I, I did love that, though. The idea of Dawes like, being associated with kissing. Man, that threw me for a loop of like the best kind. Jonathan Scott, so is it now canon in the Lawhammer timeline that wolves howling at the moon represents Ulrich asking the moon empress to take him back? I am saying something. <laughs> oh, 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 man, that's 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 a bummer. <laughs> it's so sad. Uh, Andy, where would you put all, at Luma? At Luma? What's at Luma? I feel like that's a joke about Ultima, like the car for Nippon. I'm not sure. Um, oh, oh. Oh, yeah, yeah. no, yeah, no. <laughs> I'm not sure what you're saying there. So, again, I've completely missed the point, Hammond. That's twice in a row. I'm feeling really bad and guilty now. Um, although I did laugh at your previous joke when you posted it, that made me laugh a lot. Yeah, well, I, I'm pretty sure that's a, a car brand joke because of how GW named everything after cars. Oh, right, of course. Yeah, no, I'm not doing that. Screw that joke. No, yep. no, um, no, all right, no. so. Uh, speaking of Kislev... Right, so I have one thing to say before we uh, move on, and that was I was trying to find that bloody term for a Blade oh, yeah, Master, yeah, yeah. and I can't find it. It's really bugging me. So I know uh, two places where it is. I know it's definitely inside Realm of the Ice Queen somewhere, but I'll be damned if I can recall where. But it's inside the Ambassador Chronicles because um, it was a term that was used heavily by Graham McNeil. Um, so if you want to go find it, go check out the uh, Ambassador Chronicles. There's two books, um, The Ambassador and Urson's Teeth. Ursus Teeth, pretty damn good book, actually. Um, do check those out. And when you're reading it, just remember that in Graham McNeil's mind when he was writing them, the ambassador is Sean Connery. <laughs> uh, lore from Warhammer Battle for At Luma card game? Really? I have. I, 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 need, to, I need to go check this up. I have um, no idea what he's talking about. But no, right. darn it. I hate not knowing a thing. That's really bugged me. 
Okay. Yeah. We'll find uh, out where that one after. Okay. Anyway, well, uh, Thanks, he's like that. Um, so the other uh, big new things, um, I don't think there's a lot to say about like the Kislevite warriors and the Druzina other than I've done actually quite a bit of reading uh, recently about apparently Druzina was like a really not well selected term for a character because like the word can only be used in like a plural. It means something plural. Um, so it's like a really awkward word translation, but that's Games Workshop in a nutshell. So what are you going to do? Yeah, so I I'm provide a little bit of extra context Drazina was something that was picked up from the existing warhammer books that were already out there in terms of the novels and the previous work when we were doing the uh realms of the ice queen Drazina and boyars were the two no uh, noble choices that we dropped in directly um and i kicked a minor fuss about it saying is it possible we could change the Drazina because it didn't fit anywhere near as well as boyar in terms of the overall language and the answer was yeah nah just use that one i was like right that's my job away i go um i started writing so you'll find that as i recall Drazina are in realms of the ice queen as are the boyars they're mentioned right at the very beginning and uh throughout the course of the book later so there you go. There was someone up top who went, yes. eh, oh, it won't I think, be a problem. I, I think somebody's got it. That's it. Ah, Dryaska. Dryaska, thank you. God damn it. I couldn't remember that. So I there you go. On the if tip of your Kislev tongue. was going to get a melee-centric hero, the Dryaska would be what people would recommend. Would be perfect. Um, that's popped up in most games. Kislevite Blade Master sounds super does. badass. Um, and yeah, they're Kislevite Blade Masters. Um, they carry their own uh, blade that makes it very clear that they're Blade Masters, and it's almost a badge of office to show how capable they are on the uh, battlefield. All right, so the uh, the last thing I want to talk about before we get into some of the more Games Workshop-specific things is the actual new Lore of the Hags. Um, which the Lord of Hags is now in the game. Uh, game uh, basically, Games Workshop responded to, um, or not Games Workshop, Creative Assembly responded to popular demand and managed to wiggle it in there. Um, and I, it's, it's, I like very much how it turned out. Of that, it is very unique uh, for those who haven't played Total War or don't play Total War. The thing that they did with the Lore of Hags that turned out very, very fun is they took a unique spin on it where the entire spell is hexes or enchantments or buffs or debuffs, where every spell's regular version is a curse that you inflict on an enemy, but you're there is a way to flip it where it becomes a blessing for your right. guys instead, which means every single spell in the lore is a curse or a blessing mm -hmm. simultaneously which is a very unique, creative, and awesome uh, way to handle it, actually. Um, like, they they could have gotten away with just kind of doing, like, a regular lore, um, but instead, really leaning into this, uh, and the spells that they went with, uh, they went with, like, the Forbidden Fins, which talks about, A, I love the, the way these are described. I'm curious what Andy will think about them. Of, like, the Forbidden Fin talks about that the Hag... Uh, beseeches ethereal forces deep underground to seep upwards and hamper the progress of her enemies draining momentum for them. Um, or you can uh, do the blessing version, which is she beseeches those same spirits to instead give urgency and speed to people crossing the land of Kislev where the spirits, these spirits are coming up and helping them uh, navigate uh, the very land itself. Then we've got like Witch Brew, which literally conjures a, spir a spiritual cold in <laughs> and erupts. Yeah, it just, <laughs> it, 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 it dumps, uh, it dumps yeah. a uh, nasty um, hope, like soul uh, sapping essence out that just drains people's desire to fight and hurts them and eats away at them. But if it's overcast, instead it becomes a delightful dish of goulash or whatever your favorite soup of the day may be, where you dump it over your guys and they get all healed up. Uh, as their wounds re-knit and they're uh, remade by the uh, the essence that's dumped out of the cauldron. Then mm -hmm. we talked about a little bit, the curse of the ancient witch, which no curse. a hooded figure summoned by the hag whispers words of terror, both mortal and immortal, to those who should never have gone wandering in the woods. Um, I love that the regular version is the uh, the curse of the ancient witch, where she's whispering things that no, no creature was meant to know to horrify and break them down. Or you could do the blessing of the Wis ancient witch, where the spirit is instead whispering into the ears of the Kislevites and telling them things to embolden them, to help them, yeah. to make them hold the line and fight uh, even better, to guide their arrows and tell them where the weak points on their enemies are. You then have the vengeance of spirits. I love this one where the hag channels a malevolent spirit into an enemy's soul 
to saturate their being and tears their physical body apart from the inside out. <laughs> that is horrifying, but Love awesome. It. Uh, and then you, there is the, the buff version, which is the omen of spirits, which I actually like this one because based on the description, you might go, well, what the fuck is the blessing version of that? And what's interesting is it still does damage. So mm. the, the, if you cast on the enemies, it causes like this big AOE that rips through the enemies as they're being torn from the inside out by spirits. But if you'd use the buff version, instead it fills your wizards with more magical power, but it still hurts them. Mm -hmm. So it's like these spirits are going into your, your hag's bodies and empowering them, but it's tearing at the hag's body at the same time. And then last, we have the Cursed Cauldron, which is very straightforward. It's just a cauldron manifest on the battlefield and starts spitting out vortexes, which neat. Um, yep, sure. And Let's reuse the cauldron. Yeah, Pop, but, yeah done. Well. yeah, it's great. It's great <laughs> asset. Just, 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 yeah, let's go. Uh, and then last, uh, another really fun one is the Malediction of Madness, which summons like it looks like it summons Manslib, but it inflicts Moon Madness. Yeah, which it's is weird. Very that one interesting. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it summons like a spiritual form of one of the moons at least, and it causes nightmarish visions, causing yeah. people to go completely insane. Uh, what's funny is that you could do Malediction of Madness, which is on the enemies, or Incantation of Mania, um, for, for, or which I almost kind of wish they called it Incantation of Lunacy, where you make your own guys go frenzied, but it's mm -hmm. you know they get like empowered by it. Um, so yeah, Andy, what are, what are your what are your thoughts? So um, obviously I have thoughts because I created the lore oh, in the first. Last thing I'll say. Is the little lore tidbit they have at the beginning where the hag witches draw from the power of the woodlands, Finn, noblesse of Kislev, holding those who stray into them terminally accountable. Incantations and curses take shape to summon forth the spirit magic of the land, blessing the Kislevites who fight for it and cursing those who may see it harmed. Yeah, so I won't go into any great depth about the way that the original magic was created uh, because we discussed that with the hag stream um, and yes. we went into that with some detail. But in its most simple form, the idea was that magic was deemed to be too dangerous for the hags to use. So they uh, worked through other etheric entities. They worked through spirits and all of their spells worked by manipulating spirits, keeping themselves, let's say, pure or at least cleaned from the actual magic that was around them. Uh, but that came at a cost and that cost was their own beauty, their own the, their appearance and the more they used the magic the more the spirits in turn took from them and they slowly became those old wizened hags that we all know from various fairy tales they were always supposed to be like a fairy tale-esque very eastern europe version of how magic could express inside the warhammer world now obviously when uh, a new version comes out they will take the ideas that came before they'll take the bits they like they'll change it into something new and looking through it much of what the original intention was is still there so obviously I'm super pleased I'm also super pleased because it exists at all uh, let's hmm. just be very very blunt here normally when new editions come out they just go I've got a really cool idea so I'm going to make that and they make that, and then perhaps they look back a little bit over their shoulder at what came before, and they include a little detail here or there. But in this case, no, we've got the lore of the hag. That's that's what I created. Um, and they have taken the core concept of that, which is it's the spirits themselves and its curses and its blessings, because all the spells were about blessings and curses, because the spirits themselves were the ones that were doing it. And some of them involved quite literally drawing a spirit inside you, taking on the form of the ancient widow, or throwing those spirits out towards others and giving them back bad luck or some other form of court curse. <laughs> it's all there, and that is super wonderful. There's a couple of things that tonally I don't appreciate as much. Um, for example, the reinforcement nowadays of moving on towards cauldrons and similar feels very much like the classic witch stereotype, rather than necessarily the hag witch stereotypes that we were drawing from, that I was desperately trying to not make it feel like it could have been any old fairy tale witch from the middle of Germany, which many of the uh, old fairy tales feel like, and they've fallen down hard on that here. So it feels less like it was drawn from Eastern Europe and feels a little bit more like it's just generic haggy witchy thing. And that's fine. I mean, it's not, a, it's not really a criticism. It's just they've gone in a different direction cool. I still really like it. I like how it's expressing. It's just, for me, it, um, it's tonally a little bit different, and that's what they've chosen to do. Um, I really like that um, the overall feel of it mostly being spirits 
is 100% held in place because even if that particular part of what the magic is sourced in has changed, it allows it to, for those, if they don't write anything about it, to still fit within the eight winds of magic spectrum by saying this isn't a wind of magic they're using. It's all bubbling up from the land. It's the spirits that they're manipulating. All of that's still held in place, and I really quite like that. Um, I don't have anything to say really about the individual um, uh, curses and blessings. They are what they are. They all do. The yeah, only, and they're, you know, Total warified. Yeah, uh, totally. Yeah. And they're, they're massively total warified. Um, yeah. uh, my only overall comment is that they stick largely to what I originally put in place. So I could not be more happy if I tried. It's just nice to see things that you imagined maybe a decade and a half ago being re expressed and reimagined in new and exciting ways. <laughs> oh, it's Andy, just, I, it's just I awesome. Think it, I think it was more than a decade and a half ago. Please yeah. <laughs> don't say that. It was a decade and a half ago. What oh, year is it? Holy shit, it was no, more than a decade and a half it ago. It was more like Crap. two decades ago. <laughs> Dude, shut up. You're making me feel old. <laughs> no, it's not that old. It wasn't 2004. It was about 2009, I think. Okay. So, you know, not that long ago. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Crap. All right. Uh, Cole, <laughs> Cole be carrying. Uh, with how old, powerful, and anti-heroish Mother Ostenka is, could she have Frost Beam Beastmen and or Frost Wood Elves? So I'm going to put a pin in that because we're right about to get to the short story and talk about yeah, the, new, the new lore. So I will. we will swing back around to that, uh, or we will talk about that in the midst of that. So just hang in for Here just a second. And if uh, we miss it, Colby, make sure you do ping us again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Anthony okay. Riley, damn, I'm late, but at least I made it. Hey, uh, worst case scenario, you can always catch the VOD. We really appreciate all the views and stuff, and lots of people showed up today. Glad to see you all. Uh, it's lovely to see all your you all rock, beautiful faces, because uh, we can see you. Anyway, <laughs> into um, your yeah, monitor, yeah. <laughs> Vic Lynch. Uh, as I lead Kislev on a war of conquest against Norska, uh, mm -hmm. uh, as always, I wonder about which headcanon sounds more plausible. And I subjugating the northern tribes <laughs> or a Kislevites moving into these awful places? Uh, por que no los dos mm -hmm. would be my response. Uh, because remember, there is nobody as used to a harsh lifestyle as Kislevites. If anyone yeah. could actually move into Norska and be like, look, this is land we could do something with, it would be the goddamn Kislevites. Mm. It's fair. Um, and then last, uh, so to run a Kislev army in the old world, run as Empire and Hag as Wizard Lord with demonology with Calais, Celestial Lions as Griffins. The yeah, you could kind of do some stuff like yeah. that if you're if you're wanting to do some kit bashes. Um, yeah, stuff. you uh, know that's not. I, I in the greater scheme of things, that's not too bad. You get a pretty decent army out of that. Yeah. So, um, uh, let's. I think we'll come back to. Uh, let me the... just um, drop. Hey, bye, foot. Congratulations. Oh. <laughs> maybe many years later but congratulations yeah nice <laughs> nice nice uh so uh we will come back i, I saw somebody ask about the golden knight we're gonna come back around to that but oh I wanna, can't I wanna, the golden knight because golden uh, knight's awesome yeah but i want to talk about mother of you first so yes. uh we're gonna talk about the short story the uh things in the woods um which not, not to be confused with the things in the woods <laughs> which are a unit um so it is an interesting short story uh those of you who were maybe here uh, last week i i did a live reading of it and we talked about it a bit that um, overall, it's got some interesting notes. It took an interesting tone um, where one of the things I want to say just right off the bat is that Mother Ostakia is portrayed quite differently from the way she's portrayed in game, uh, where in game she has a lot of dialogue, uh, obviously. And she talks a lot and you get a good feeling for her. Where Mother Ostakia comes off as a very, she comes off as very mischievous um and very like sarcastic would probably be a good way to put it like she says things that like uh, she has some very funny quotes in total war where she acts like offended uh or uh and she mocks people constantly she's very mocking she's very mischievous in how she responds and she comes off like one of those characters where if you ran into her it would be spooky and she probably wouldn't hurt you but you'd be on edge the entire time because she would definitely poke fun at your expense um, by messing with you of like getting you to try the cheese, uh, which she says often you'd be sitting there going, I feel like if I eat that cheese, it's going to make my head explode. She goes, maybe it will, maybe it won't. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, but in the story, she's portrayed horrifically, like just flat out horrifically, um, which I do think the intent was to try and make it very clear that Elstankia is not just a good guy, um, that she is something 
at best or at most generous could be described as an anti-hero. Um, but I kind of wish the story had been more about showing her in different perspectives instead of, because the way the story goes through for those that haven't read it, which you should, is that it basically tells a story and then goes, no, 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 that's not what happened. It was actually worse. And then it goes, no, 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 that's not what happened. It was actually worse. Yep. And it just keeps doing that until you get to the end of the story, which is fine, but it kind of leads to, if you don't like take everything else from the game in context with it makes mother Ostenkia just come off as like fucking evil. Yeah. Okay. I'm, this is the no, bit that I. This is the it. bit that I we were discussing before the stream because yeah. I had um, just reread the story and I didn't want to be negative because being overly negative rarely brings much benefit unless you're trying to bring it's something to the table it's and you're criticism. trying to be constructive and you're looking for what you could do to make it better. So I'm instead going to try and take it from that angle. Um, number one, they need to hire a fucking editor. And the, the, the swear word is necessary. Um, there are words in there that are just wrong. Now, you could say, hey, the lore's changed, so we can change a few words. Yeah, but you can't do that to English. Um, when one steals oneself against something, one is not stealing something. There is a host of minimal small errors all the way through that just makes it feel unprofessional. If ever there's anyone from Creative Assembly or anyone that's involved with this that passes by the stream and hears this, hire a freaking editor. I'll do it myself <laughs> if necessary. Send it to me and I'll edit it. I'm a professional editor. I'll do the bloody job because it oh, annoys me when I read it and I feel like this is the output of an extremely professional company to all of the fans and the best that they can do is an error-ridden document for a story that could otherwise be much cleaner. So, issue number one. Issue number two is that it doesn't feel like this knows what it wants to say about the character. Now, obviously, the story does have a very clear message about how Mother Estankia is this strange, let's say, almost fairy tale style witch that people are telling stories about. And each of these stories slightly contradict, they get worse, and they have a potentially terrifying figure. But if that's the sort of fairy tale tone that you're going for, don't undermine it by having her come up at the end and go, Hi! I'm Mother Stinker! Da, 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 da. Ruins the fairy tale. Completely ruins the fairy tale. Um, it would have been far better if it faded to black with the horror arriving without them actually being aware of exactly what was coming down, except for the laughter, the giggle of whatever it is that's going to be responsible for bringing about their end. It was altogether too much painting of black and white characters. Mm. It just didn't quite do the job at the end. But the bigger issue isn't that. Because sure, that's that's a tale that could have just done with a quick, hey, we could have massaged the ending, done a couple of things to make it properly horrific, and also have it fade to black in a way that means that you don't need to paint Mother Estenkia as a character who is an out-and-out -out bad guy, which is what it was super close to doing. But the bigger picture is, what story are they trying to tell for Kislev and Mother Estenkia? And if the story is what they told, I'm not really that interested in it. It's not a good story for mm. overall what is happening in the heart of Kislev. If the story of Kislev is Mother Stenkia is a fairy tale style character that's very difficult to know whether she's good or evil or where she lies, she's a force of nature rather than necessarily something that you can go, oh, she's here, yay! If that's the case, then tell that story in a far more dramatic, takes down the bad guys, but everyone else gets wiped out along with it. You know, you don't want her to come, but at the same time, without her, we'll all die. There's lots of different ways that that story can be told. This did not tell that story because it was nothing about doing something that was important for the bigger scheme of things. It was just basically vengeful. To cut a long story short, I didn't like it. Now, I did. Uh, the writing's fine. David Geimer's doing a good job. Um, whatever it is that he's been asked to do, he's clearly done. But that doesn't mean that I feel like it did its job. It didn't do a job to characterize Kislev in a good way, to characterize the character in a good way. And if you go back to the previous one where he had um, good old Guan Bo doing his thing, that was awesome. There was, there was all sorts of cruel there, except for maybe the non-murder of crows. <laughs> the gaggle of crows. Yeah, the cruel gaggle of crows. Yeah. The gaggle of crows. That, that's another editing error that deserved a click. Um, but that was awesome. This one did much less. It told me less about Kislev than the other one told. It told me less about the overall character of the nation. It told me less about the character um, other than was actually awful. And it felt like to me that the story of Kislev was being done a disservice and that people who would read it would go, oh, wow. Yeah, what 
what I found interesting um, is that I I definitely agree that I it was a hmm, I think the best way I could describe it is that the story may, leaned too heavily into telling or like telling not showing um in that it, it was a little it was a little too open yeah, yeah it was it was a little too see-through um like i think it could have benefited a lot from being a lot more mysterious um mm. and leaving a lot more up in the air like i think it would have been better leaving the story on an end of like letting the reader try to figure out what mother ostenka's character actually is instead of how the story kind of handled it but i feel like i understand what the story was trying to go for Mm -hmm. um it just didn't quite stick the landing in a few places because it was it was just a little too obvious um yeah certain concepts um yeah. of like the idea that mother stanky shows up and like there there are bits that when i take and look at i'm like i like this like the yeah. idea that Mother Ostenkia shows up on the eve of a battle. A fog rolls over the battlefield. And everyone hears like horrific sounds. And is like, oh, what the fuck's going on in there? Cool. Great. Awesome. Yeah. The idea that Mother Ostenkia might save your life and come to you and say, hey, I've done something for you. You must now do something in return. That's the bargain. Okay. Um, I think the whole like story with like the punishment of the village because of one guy's arrogance and then it, 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 there are some weird things that happen with that part of the story um, that yeah. get a little odd where then mother Ostankia allows the village to be destroyed, even though they did what they, what she asked of them. And then they die anyway, kind of is like, I don't feel like the, that gets across the point. It's supposed it one it, like it. I don't understand what the point of that is. Yeah. It's totally off. Um, and it, for something like this, it's super easy to nail down the tone. It's super easy to ensure that you, you pin it in place and this one did not feel like it was pinning it in place it left an unsure taste concerning the character um and ultimately made the character feel like something i'd rather not use um yeah. because yeah. it wasn't mm. like i would have i would have much preferred if the story had been not oh children are vanishing from the village until this one guy gets dealt with of instead of us getting to see what kind of afflictions he personally starts dealing with as there are like spirits that start moving against him. Um, yeah, there's lots of ways it could have been done. Um, yeah. uh, I, I don't want to dwell on this one too that much. Makes sense. That I makes said, sense. Yeah. What I do want to get into is the little nuggets from the story that I think are interesting to examine. Um, yes. One of the things that jumped out at me that the, the story just kind of mentions briefly, but I was like, whoa, is they mentioned the Woodland Fae in part yeah, of the story. Yeah, that was a thing. Which, like, <laughs> I'm sorry, are those wood elves? Like, do, do the Kislevites know about wood elves and are like, yeah, that was a thing. Don't fuck with those guys. Um, because if so, that would be awesome. Like, I would love if there have been wood elves spotted in now, this, the spirits of the wood were something that was phased in again and again and again in previous uh, Kislev lore. So, if it's nothing more than a spiritually active area, the whole point of um, many of the writings for Kislev is that Kislev is much more spiritually active than other mm. parts of the old world. It's somewhat like the Laurel Lord in many respects, but filled with icy weirdness and lots of mischievous spirits and all sorts of craziness. The woods, the woods are failed. Now, would that be something that would perhaps attract the wood elves? Your first thought would go, well, surely, yes. But most of it came post the elves coming into the old world. It was with the arrival, presumably, of Mother Kislev or the Ancient Widow mm. or whatever they turn that into that becomes the source of the ice magic. Um, and then the Gostars coming in and effectively protecting it. Um, it's that whole situation, which is not old. It's only like a thousand years or so old. Mm. Um, and uh, the land had rose up in spiritual activity significantly during that time. Before that, the hags were doing something as to what they were doing. Who can say? Now, the lore is going to be all rewritten. The Ungols and the Gostars are presumably, given the post that we got, going to be broadly merged together as one yeah, culture. We'll, we'll talk which, about that. Yeah, which is a, a thing. Um, but uh, I think here it's a fascinating it, it, view it, as to what it could be. Yeah, it feels like he's being like, oh, they're like spirits of the wood. It's just weird to use the word fey because that is a very yeah, it, strong it's a loaded connotation. Term. It yeah. absolutely is. It's a loaded term in Warhammer because of the Wood Elves and the Wood Elf Army list. And if they're not using it for that term, then it is foolish. Yeah, use you should a different have edited word. it. Use a different <laughs> word. And this yeah. is another example where if that is not their intent, then the editor should have caught it and said, is this what you want to say? Because if they didn't, they should have used a different word because there are many better words to use. 
yeah many uh, better words some other bits that really jumped out at me as far as uh i do like the show of that it is very unclear what the hell mother ostenka is as yeah. far as is she a person that's very old or is she a thing mm -hmm. uh because we get that some kiss of like that i i do like that it does it from like them kind of doing storytelling of there are people that believe that she's not even remotely human that instead she's literally just like marsh grass and mud assembled into a human shape and filled with things love that yeah which is yeah. very terrifying cool and she gets shot through the heart and is like all right cute <laughs> which like oh okay <laughs> uh the, i i really enjoy that they leave it very nebulous um even from like playing in total war we have no idea if mother ostenki is just like the first hag or if she's just a particularly old one or like that story suggests she could quite literally be a, a collection of spirits puppeting some kind of body around mm. um which is really gross and really cool sounding and I love all of that because it speaks to the sort of tales that would circulate around an ancient figure of her type. And it's very much the sort of thing that I don't just support. I'm like, yeah, do that. Because mixing it up with myth really does make her a much more a grounded character inside the setting. It makes her feel, if anything, more real for all these stories are, if anything, ridiculous and over the top. Um, because it's the sort of stories that would be wrapped around someone like that. And it's all too easy to take our God view and go, here's Mother Estenka. She is our ancient hag. Um, and she does stuff in Kislev. Done. But once you contextualize it in terms of what the people of Kislev think, what people coming in think, suddenly she becomes so much more. And yeah, really love that. Yeah. Then we have the other interesting concept, which I don't hate because it kind of mirrors a concept we've seen in some other factions, but takes it a different direction of the idea that Mother Ostenkia takes children um, and that not in the sense of like she eats them. It's very clear that she doesn't. Instead, she raises them and they kind of become like almost mortal agents or mortal representatives where the story kind of revolves around that there are these three boys that she quite literally raises her on her own and they become very faithful followers of hers and granted i feel like this almost is trying to lean into explaining why you have like kislevite warriors in your roster when you're playing as mother ostenka yeah. which is fine like that's fine but, that's what it felt like <laughs> yeah, yeah but i do find it interesting because like we we have a lot in like in a lot of uh bretonian like wood elf lore there's a lot of talk about like the wood elves stealing children that uh venture too close to athel lauren or obviously there's the whole thing with like the fey enchantress taking children Fain that Fain are magically enabled mm -hmm. uh but this story actually going further and exploring like what happens to these children is that mother Estekia makes use of them um and they go on to serve her in various ways which i don't hate it's one of those things that like that could be like if I was running a role play game, that could be a really fun character for a PC is someone that was taken by Mother Ostankia and raised by her and is like having to kind of act out her will in the world while keeping it a secret. I, I really like that as a concept. Um, it's it's interesting. Once again, it's just kind of thrown in the story and not really explored very deeply. Um, yep. But it's like, oh, that's that's it, and that go. I think that actually does a good job of explaining, you know, the the mother Ostankia that she's literally mother to all um i i i wish the story had leaned more into exploring her from that direction instead of just the like horrifying kind of deal maker perspective uh because i find that so much more interesting um, i know i i'm cool with either if i'm being blunt it's just you need to nail the story you yeah. need to you, you need to have something that your 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 reader can have empathy with and go oh um, and it just didn't quite do that. Um, I also really like the idea of that as a nice character thing. The pooling kids, doing something with the kids, building them up. We did that something with the very original hags, in that some of the hags were taking children, but the reason mm. they were doing it is because they were mutants and they were destined to be mutants. So they were pulling them from the communities before anyone realized that their child was going somewhere dark. And that was also a pretty interesting and compelling tale. And there was one hag in particular who was attempting to train them to be effectively a giant mutant team to take out people from the north, use chaos against chaos. Yeah, which I love Deeply that. controversial and not something that should be done. Yeah, but I, I love that this story kind of supports that as a potential yeah. theme. Um, um, and, and it's a really nice idea. And to see these ideas being um, repitched and used in different ways, I think is brilliant. Um, it's just the story itself. Yeah. I shrug um, that. 
Yeah. yeah, I I found the omens to be they a like cool that. concept, except for the one where like the dude's wife like literally like turns into Mother Ostanky for a second. That one felt ah. a little, that one felt a little <laughs> on the nose. Um, but I like the other ones of that she is like literally using omens to try and warn people, and you're supposed to mm. pick up on it. I like that. That kind of leans into in Kislev. You should be superstitious because it's not just like oh look the birds are flying in a weird pattern. No, you it's should not take superstitious. That very, like you should take that very fucking seriously in yeah. Kislev. Yeah, it's uh, not superstition. It's it's an actual uh, fact. Yeah, um, which I like. You know, I like that a lot. Yeah. Um, of that, like the motherland is a place where if you're from the empire, they'd be like, "Oh, that's ridiculous! Like, why would you think that it's stupid?" And they're like, "No, you don't understand." <laughs> like, <laughs> um, and then the last thing for me is yeah, uh, the, the story thing. really, I think, addressed a concern a lot of people have been pointing out with the things in the woods, um, also known as Beowulves, uh, where the story kind of addresses the Beowulves as that. Um, while I don't think it a hundred percent ties down on it, um, I like that they didn't, one of the things I was worried about with the Beowulf, cause I saw a lot of people were like, oh, that's stupid. They're chaos creatures. Why are they in the Kislev roster? Yada, yada, yada. Um, whereas the short story, I think does a pretty good job of demonstrating that they're nightmarish mutated monstrosities. Mm -hmm. Yes, but they are not creatures of chaos in the sense that like a chaos spawn is. Yeah. Um, they're, they're, they, uh, the story talks about that the bale wolves went, uh, were created somewhere and then they wandered into the deep forest and became kind of linked. Uh, and that mother Ostenka or the hags formed some kind of pact or bond with them. Uh, and now they act as these agents and they're these horrifying, almost bear sized creatures that are tougher than leather and have exposed skulls and stuff. But it was kind of like how we were talking about earlier with the Celestial Dragon Emperor, where what is and isn't a chaos creature is very fuzzy. Yeah, particularly when you're dealing with etheric entities, spirits, and the like. It's really fuzzy. Yeah, like, it, is it still canon that if a Beowulf bites a human, they will turn into a Beowulf? Maybe. Um, that's certainly possible and yeah. would actually make for a really interesting, spooky creature. Um, I, I like the idea of that it could be a curse and that i think that would fit with the hags very well that it's yeah. literally a curse that can be inflicted on people mm -hmm. uh, i'd work very well particularly if they're protecting them yeah so i like i think they fit super duper well like did they originate from mordheim sure but like the idea that the hags are resourceful enough to turn a natural or not a natural in that sense but like a curse that was not orchestrated by any one particular entity to their own benefit is very haggy yeah, totally. Particularly because it's dealing with curses, assuming that it, that's what it is. Plus, I'd also add, um, try not to get too stuck upon what the expression of an entity or a creature was in a previous edition or a different game, mm. because you're always going to end up being disappointed. Um, it's one of the things that I have had to let go of, even though as a writer, when I'm writing, I much prefer trying to drag everything together and make it all make sense together. So I don't like contradicting previous lore if I can avoid doing that. But sometimes you literally can't avoid doing that because Games Workshop will say, this is what the lore is now. And you're like, but that doesn't match anything that comes before. Do you know that? And they're like, this is what it is now. That's what you write. And you're like, okay, fair enough. That's what I'm going to go right now. Um, and that means that sometimes for all you might go, it was like this in more time, for example, it means nothing for how it's being presented here. It is at best an influence. And for those of us who are sitting on the outside, which we all are going, well, how does that all tie together? We can, of course, speculate and try to make them make sense. But ultimately, yeah. they might just be different things now. Yeah. And the thing is, is that, one thing that I think allows me and Andy to keep our sanities is that we tend to find joy in figuring out how we can meld these things together. Damn straight we do. Yeah. <laughs> There's a challenge there, but it's a fun yeah. one. Um, you you can't you cannot turn it into like trench warfare, or no. you're, you're or you're gonna hate it. Like you're gonna hate the entire setting, and you're gonna hate yeah. everything that ever happens. Um, and I think which... Mother Stanky is a perfect example of that, actually, because she is quite clearly stated by Creative Assembly as the only. Yep, which perfect segue. The, well, it, indeed, it was, wasn't it? Is <laughs> uh, <laughs> as the only hag mother, the only one. There is no other hag mother. She is now effectively the prime and only example of the hag mother. So she is somewhat like the Baba Yaga esque figure. She is somewhat like the Witch of the Wood you might find in, say, Dragon Age one, two, or three. If you've played those games, I won't go into any details on that 
lest I make a spoiler, but it's that same character. We have a similar sort of character popping up in, say, Baldur's Gate, although in that case, it's just one of multiples. So where the hags is originally written, all the hag mothers were the ancient, the ones who had been with the using the lore of hags for longest, many of which had been using it for centuries upon centuries. They were they were far, far worse than Mother Estanke was in any way, shape, or form. Far more hideous, far more hunched over. Some of them made Baba Yaga look relatively normal. If you're looking at the sea hag, for example, at the bottom of the sea, she'd been over there for a, a good couple of thousand years. She's proper broken. They're all gone now. We only have ourselves a single version of that. And as we were saying, to try and merge those things with the world as it was, it's not that hard. You can easily do it. Um, you can have her both be what she is and all of those other things if you wish to do so. But Games Workshop output, nonetheless, according to what Creative Assembly have said, is going to say she is the hag mother. Yeah, and it's it's interesting. Um, I don't hate the change. It's an interesting change uh, yeah. that it's her, A, it, you know, it makes her more unique. Uh, but B, I think it kind of leans more heavily into, which I think is a good thing, of the mystery of that. It kind of makes her almost feel like she's not human and maybe never was. Uh, or if she was, she's kind of like an Ariel Orion situation where like she left her humanity behind and became something other um, with time. And that all other hag witches are more on the human scale. Um, yeah. Where at the very least, they were all originally human, but she may not have been. Um, which is interesting. Like, that's a fun yes. mystery to have that I don't think needs an answer. No, neither do I. Um, uh, I, I actually get, you might be surprised, quite a few emails and messages about this one because the hags have changed so fundamentally and completely when you look at what they are in Total War and clearly what Creative Assembly say that Games Workshop intends to do with them in comparison to how I wrote them. And I have to say basically the same thing each time. I'm not only not worried about this, I am kind of excited. I love seeing how people adapt my work and turn it into something else. I'm not one of those ones who go, no, I wrote it like this. This is how it should be. No, not at all. It's, this is not my material. It's Games Workshop's material. It can be turned into anything they want. They own it. It's that simple. And seeing what they change it into for me is kind of fascinating, the aspects they took. Now, if I'm being back to my Andy hat on rather than the writer that has done things, and just what I personally prefer, um, I'm, I kind of don't hate it, but I kind of don't like it at the same time in that it's mm. not the choice I would have made. And that's purely because um, it lacks cultural flair and detail. Um, I love the idea of having this ancient widow-esque figure. This, let's not even use widow because that's even redolent with older terms, but this ancient witch that is perhaps not like the other hags, that perhaps the other hags are following, for example. I love that, but they have presented her as altogether too human in terms of how she's expressed, that it makes it, in many respects, take away from something being that. She's very, very human and almost vindictive. But um, it comes across in a, a less spiritual, less culturally interesting way, mm. and more just a classic witch. It's, she's just a witch. Um, and whilst that's fun, it lacks flavor. And ultimately, from a Warhammer stuff, I love things that drip with flavor um and kislev um is dialing itself up to 11 as warhammer always does whenever warhammer takes something it takes a look at it and goes what can i do to make this spikier bigger scullier <laughs> cooler <laughs> ultimately cooler what can we do to really dial this up particularly when it comes to the war game what can we do to make this as cool as freaking possible what's going to make most people look at it and go holy shit balls yes i want to play with that and as we all know one of their first touchstones is taking something that everybody already knows and saying well this is the warhammer version of it now admittedly they don't necessarily say that out loud but that's loosely what they do the hags were that as originally conceived and the new version with ostankia as the personification of what it is is again another attempt at that and this one for me is just less characterful than what was there before and that ultimately, and I don't mean what was before was better. I just mean it was more dialed into Eastern culture, for example, mm. um, where this one feels more Western in approach and feels much more like something you get from a DD and d game um, from Dragon mm. Age um, and feels less uniquely Warhammer for me. Um, it feels less uniquely Kislev for me for all once you get the story, it gets sunk into Kislev and you suddenly go, OK, there's some Kislev elements I know. We've used the words that I'm used to seeing with Kislev and there's Mother Astankia coming along. Now it's slowly coming together, but nevertheless, she still feels somewhat external 
to the rest of it from my perspective. So I'm not saying bad. I'm not saying good. It's just more of a meh. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of interesting. It's this is one of the few, eh, not super few, but this is definitely one of the times mm. where like I would really love to see a deeper role play examination of what they're doing with the new Kislev to yeah. really dive down into like, okay, I get that from a total war perspective, we only have Hag, which is a mother of Stankia, but if we actually were to examine it with a bigger lens, there would probably be a, a wider spectrum, and I really want to see that spectrum. Uh, because total war just it's simple it has to simplify things to such an extreme yeah totally um but uh but it 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 is very interesting which of course we could speak about the changes to kislev from games workshop are odd um games workshop <laughs> kind of came in swinging with the bat uh, on a lot of these articles and for the kislev article the big thing they did was basically coming in and saying okay yeah so we understand the way they worded it, uh, which granted, I feel bad for Rich or whoever it was writing up the CA article because it felt like he was like, okay, I'm going to try and not step on any barbed wire while I'm writing Holy this. crap, but... <laughs> yeah. Um, I would just like to say that if Rich or anyone close to him ever re uh, watches this, um, uh, we feel for you, man. <laughs> yeah, that, that is someone going, don't shoot the messenger. It's not my fault. <laughs> don't shoot me. Um, wow. But yeah. uh, so Games Workshop has basically come down and said that in their new version of Kislev, while there used to be an extreme separation between the Ungols and the Gospodars, that by the time of 8th edition Warhammer Fantasy, they're basically homogenized. Um, that there's there are still splits between rural and urban, but there's no longer really splits between Gospodar and Ungol. Which, within the game itself, that's not true. Um, the game itself yeah. actually reinforces that no, there is an extreme difference between the Ungols and the Gospodars. Um, mm -hmm. But Games Workshop, which is funny because it's CA is trying to lean into this concept because they really like it, but Games Workshop seems to be trying to lean away from the concept because they don't yeah. like it, which is really weird to watch. Uh, and I don't. Um, I have no idea why Games Workshop is doing that. It's a very interesting right. decision. So um, the, the answer seems to be pretty simple. Um, uh, now, obviously, this is not going to be the answer because it's an external one and who knows what's going on behind the scenes. But the answer seems to be pretty simple. And that is we're making freaking Kislev. We're not making something complicated. We're making a simple army that we can drop in an army list that we can explain. And we can say that they were made from Gospodars and Ungols in the same way that we can say the Empire was made out of Umberigans and Udoses and Cherusins or whatever. Mm. This is the Empire nowadays. Okay. And the Empire nowadays, they're all together and we're all working together towards the Empire. And they're doing something similar for Kislev. But for me, it is an egregious crime. Um, and it's an egregious crime because cultural identity is not so easily erased to simply try and attempt to erase something over a thousand years is to laugh at anything close to historical um, equivalence just look at peoples today that are still grasping onto roots that are maybe three thousand years old while they'll be moving through community after community or worse when they're on their own i mean go to almost any country with an indigenous population that is an indigenous population and they are quite discreet from the other populations. And of course, there is merging. There's mer there's lots of melding, but there's also lots of separations too. And to simply say it all works is so laughably simplistic and speaks terribly to those who may come from indigenous populations in the real world, basically saying your cultures will be completely eradicated and eroded from any imperialistic power that comes in, in this case, the Gospodars, whose power does come in and eradicates the culture that was there before because they are the ruling top culture. And they're saying that nowadays, yeah, ruling top culture does the lot. There's a couple of bits that they've taken in, but it's very much cultural taking in the same way that the United Kingdom, for example, would go somewhere else, invade and say, hey, look, here's our unit from there. But they're all drinking tea. Um, it's it's horrendous. I actually hate it. Um, there is very little about this that makes me feel um, happy with that as an outcome, particularly given that there's much more than a couple of different groups there it's not just the gospelers and the uncles there's others that live there as well and mm, they have been yeah. detailed again and again in lots of different books as having their own communities with their own backgrounds and they have antagonisms it's a complicated world and simplifying it this way is completely understandable for the um, books but enforcing it feels 
yeah, unfortunate. It's, yeah, uh, uh, kind of like you were saying, it feels like an uh, empire empireification of Kislev, which is weird. Um, yeah, it does. Uh, uh, of granted, I'm I'm going to be frank, um, and if anyone from Games Workshop watches this and disagrees, uh, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, um, of that, it, I'm glad that the video game just frankly did not agree. Um, where the video game leans very heavily into your uncle units have unique abilities yeah. and unique attributes, and there are characters that have buffs and techs relating to whether they are Gospodarian or Ungols. And it's very strange for games. And the thing that's really interesting to me is that Games Workshop says this, but they sing a very different tune if you go back about a year to a year and a half ago, um, almost two years ago now, where uh, they released a short story. I can't remember if Andy Hall wrote it or David, I think Andy Hall wrote it, of uh, they wrote a story to introduce Kostaltin as a character mm. uh, to try and help everyone understand who he was. And the whole point of Kostaltin is that he hates the Ungols, is that he views the Ungol people as backwards barbarians who are inviting in the forces of chaos because of their outdated beliefs. And he is literally purging mm. them. Like he is, he is torturing people trying to figure out who Mother Ostenkia is and where she is because he thinks she's a chaos entity and he's mm. trying to kill her. And like, there's the whole thing with Prince Yuri, who's like the the character from the the intro that ends up turning into the demon prince. His whole big thing is that he's an ungol prince, and he faces yeah. a lot of prejudice because he's ungol. And a lot of the Gospodari princes are very uncomfortable that Katarin has been ascending ungol bloodlines to royal authority, which is key to the story Total War is trying to tell. And then a year and a half later. Games Workshop comes waddling in and is like, ah, bop, 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 we don't want this anymore, which is, it's just weird. Like, there's clearly it been is. a change in direction. And um, it's a change in direction that I feel, and I fully accept that this could just be me, um, but I feel sanitizes um, Kislev and makes it less interesting as a place. It's these differences that um, drive, these conflicts that drive all the cool stories that are in the place. Those who um, are bigoted um, and the people who rise up against them and try to resolve these issues. There's all sorts of great stuff that can come out of there, but to try and pretend that everybody's lovey-dovey works together and it's all better now is, for me, just weak um, and makes for a less interesting Kislev. It's a change that I not only don't like, it's one that I actively don't like. Um, and I would be very sad to see if this is pushed on. In Total War, for example, I don't like that the Kislev units in general don't have different models. Understand why they don't have different models. That'd be expensive. But that doesn't mean that I don't <laughs> wish that my Ungol um, troops had Ungol styled models. They look completely different, the Ungols. And I don't like the idea that you could have something like a, a rota of Ungol winged lancers. The winged lancers are Gospodarini troops. Um, they come from the Gospodar tribe and Long Hovely, and they are quite quite convinced that's who they are um those who have naturalized to that of course can join in but there is a discrete section of ungols that would never be there and it's a shame to see that that has been completely eroded or at least that's what i feel and if you disagree that's totally cool we don't have to agree in these things um if some people will almost certainly prefer this style of kislev and they'll see what i'm saying as something that is probably unjustified or perhaps i'm seeing something that isn't there that's also okay because we all have different views on how these things land but for me i find that kislev is less interesting with this push and i can't say that reading the post that came from creative assembly made me feel like they thought it was more interesting either because it was incredibly defensive um in that we understand you might have this expectation for it being like this it's not like that's games workshop yeah <laughs> yeah um uh, yeah, it's interesting. So, if anybody for GW watches this, I feel pivot, super. Pivot. Yes. Go back. Go back. Or I just, feel super sorry for Creative Assembly in this case. You know, honestly though, like I, I feel they stuck the landing as good as they could have. Uh, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm pretty happy with a lot of the updates. I, I massively feel. And if, uh, Richard thought it was an easy post. I literally bow down to you, man, because you did a good job. Yep. Uh, so real quick, I do want to get caught up on super chat stuff. Uh, yeah, let's catch will, up with the super chats, and then there we're going to talk about some Zinchi goodness. Uh, oh, but we'll like talk about things. the Golden Knight, then we'll talk about Zeke. Oh, Golden Knight. Well, let's get our Super Chats first, because it's quite okay. a few that come uh, Okay, we already did that one. Out of my monitor. Already signed up for Dark D. Oh, yeah. superb! You rock! Wait a minute, can I get a thing for that? Yes, I can. 
Um, if you would also like to sign up for more knowledge about Dark Deeds, there is a post. Can't believe that somebody actually posted by that, so I don't need to. It's a new game coming from Rookery Publications. I mean, if he is, and it's absolutely awesome. And it comes from many of the names that you may or know, uh, you may know or love from Warhammer's background because, well, we're pals and we made a game and it's awesome. Yep, so there, there is you a go. Recent Rookery stream about it. So if you want more details, go watch that. Yeah, we uh, did that last night. Uh, so it should be over in Rookery Publications where Mark and I have a big long chat about different things about the game. We're going to yep. be showing some art later as well. It's be super Rookery fun. Publications on YouTube. Go subscribe while you're at it. Yeah, thanks uh, very much. Sean Soltz, what? Uh, what, what do you think the Northern Dawi think of the hags and the things in the woods? Based on how dwarves tend to react to those kind of things, they probably don't like them at all. Yeah. Yeah, at all. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, but it's not their business. They're down in their holds. They'll be like, "Yep, yeah, not my business, not my concern." As long as it doesn't uh, impact them, they've got their own thing to do. Yeah, there'll probably be some fun stories about like dwarves that went out to uh, harvest a forest and were never oh, heard yeah. from again for some reason. Uh, and there's like spookiness about that. And there's some notes in the Book of Grudges against particular places rather than people, which could be really fun. Uh, I also particularly like the idea as well that um, if, if you were writing a different sort of story, because the obvious one would be the dwarves who get spooked out and things don't go, but you could twist that story on its head and um, have the spirits and the hags actually not able to influence them in the same way that they can influence others because they're so anti-magical. <laughs> and that could be a super fun way of dealing with it as well. Um, uh, there's lots of different stories that could be told, but I, I, told, but I ultimately I... think... I know this is not what you meant by it, but I love the idea of like a dwarf war van and the Kisselfights or the, the hags and the spirits are trying to scare them. But the dwarves are like people that have seen too many horror movies and they're like, ah, that's low quality. That's fake. That's fake. Like they're, they're just like, they're just not scared at all. Cause they're like, ah, bullshit. Yeah, whatever. I just yeah, like, Jesus. <laughs> Uh, but again, trying to spin that into a good story is is a tough ask, but I think there could be a good story in there. Yeah. Uh, let's see. The story made me feel like if I lived there, I would want to say goodbye to Kislev forever and move to the Empire of the Southern Realms. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The, yeah, the David Gamer story. Yeah. 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 David Gamer story. Yeah. 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 I mean, not that they're necessarily much better, but yeah. Yeah. Luring Lion. <laughs> the ebook was missing a gaggle of hags. <laughs> Oh, I feel really sorry if David Geimer passes back here. We're really sorry. <laughs> uh, he's, he's a sweet guy. I love him to death. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, I feel bad. <laughs> tell, tell CA to give you an editor, for the love of God. <laughs> yeah, please. That's uh, what editors are for. Yeah. Uh, Lidor, uh, I love how the things in the woods move in the... Oh, yeah, this is a cool note. I love the things in the woods move in the mm. forest. They are part of it, despite their sheer size, and their form is barely noticeable. Yeah, it's a good detail. That is a great point of the story. We're like, they're, they're flesh and blood creatures. Like they're not ethereal. They they're, you know, mortal, yep, but yep. they're so part of the forest that it's, yeah. The story mentions that like the branches don't move. They don't crunch the leaves or anything, which is great. Like that is a perfect creature design for creepy dark forest is that they're part of the forest that you're the intruder, uh, which is great. Yeah. 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 Uh, I would love to see some interactions between other hags and mother of Stanky yeah. how they treat each other and how their dynamic works. Yes. Um, I'm with you. One of the things I actually really enjoy is that if you play a mother of Stanky campaign, uh, there are like quest battles essentially for each of the curses that give you a little storyline. And one of them actually talks about how there are a group of hags that get together and try to trick mother of Stanky. Uh, so they try to lure her into a fight and kill her so that they can take her power for themselves. And it talks, it, the story is interesting because it talks about how mother of Stanky kind of has okay. a, a very paranoid type relationship almost with hag witches. Super interesting. Um, where like it says something along the lines of mother Ostinkia knows better than any that you should never trust a hag. Um, because, and like there are hags that try to kill her and she's keenly aware of that. Um, which is, so did that come out, um, uh, right from the beginning? Um, no, 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 it did. It must not. That came out with the spells. Huh? No, I mean, it it's came, very recent. Yeah. Uh, so th well, that that's from when uh, her DLC came out a year ago. Okay, so, so that is older. Before okay. the spells. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah, mm. um, it's the in lion. Happy regurgitation day! Uh, love hmm. the guy. Love the work you guys put into making as much lore fit together as you can. Really helps a newer fan make sense of the chaos. I will say that's very lovely to hear. Uh, yeah, never, it is. I never thought of it that way, but hey, that's cool to think about. Yeah, um, because. And one of the great things with Games Workshop is they forget that their fans don't only buy the most recent books. Yeah. Um, and um, 
they forget that their fans have got a deeper knowledge until they remember it um, and they suddenly go, oh, that thing that we could bring back, let's bring that back this week, um, which we see happen again and again with various uh, products. So, yeah, um, we try to make sense of it all and some of it will make sense. Other parts of it are just not never going <laughs> yeah, to no. work together because they are now changed. Um, but, you know, you do what you can. Oh, good one. Uh, Adam, hey guys, are there any plans to do a Lord hey, stream reviewing the old world map? Yes. Um, yeah. we wanted to take a little break from the old world just because we we're, I, we felt it was, you know, we, we wanted to just take a break. We just uh, done three huge episodes. We will get around to it. Holy yes. moly. But yes, we're definitely getting around to that. Uh, Rogan, I think this is a symptom of total Warhammer as a whole, but the topic of cultural slash subculture representation being paywalled, haha, behind legendary lords is kind of a huge, massive detriment to the setting. It's so. It, yeah, it's a weird limitation of the game itself where, like, on yeah. one hand, it's nice that if you're like, oh, I want to focus on a particular sub-faction or subculture within this overall race, I can play this character who leans very heavily into that. Mm -hmm. But it also kind of results in, like, you don't get to see them all properly side by side like you're supposed to. Yeah. Um, Which results in some weirdness. But it's, unfortunately, I, I, it's just kind of like a... It's got positives and negatives, um, but that's a noticeable negative. Yep, agreed. Completely agreed, in fact. Um, it's not perfect, but hey, it's better than not having any of it at all. Which that's is true. kind of what Games Workshop's trying to suggest is going to happen with the Ungols and the Gospodars. Yep. Uh, Colby Carrion, uh, thank you again for the generous super chat. If CA does another North Clans DLC for Norska, who do you think Mother of Stink, or do you think Mother of Stink could get in the units, maybe a few werebears? Uh, werebears. <clears throat> yeah, the... <laughs> Uh, if if any faction was going to have cross pollination with Norska, besides like Beastmen, maybe uh, I think Kislev is a reasonable thing to consider. There are certain units that could be added to Norska that would make sense uh, within yep. a Mother of Sanctuary roster if they wanted to, and they could easily uh, make um, a Northern Empire faction as well. Um, that could easily do yeah, that. It would be a very the, easy ask. Finland faction, come on, yeah, guys. totally. Where's my where's my our Ulrich Legendary Lord, please. Totally. You do yourself a Midland faction and suddenly you've got wolfy things and bear things or whatever else you want in there. There's also yep. kinds of cool. Lord Eisen. Uh, the short story talks about how Mother O is interpreted differently in different regions. I like yeah. to think the other hag mothers are now just these different local takes on her. That's that would be one way of doing it, yes. Um, yeah. Although some of the, the, the takes would be deeply contradictory and weird. Um, but yeah, sure. Yep, that, that is a way it could be done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and like, I would not be surprised if like they wanted to keep those characters around. They might just be very, very powerful hag witches, but still be technically hag witches. Yeah, um, sure. But uh, yeah. It would be an easy thing to do depending upon how hag witches eventually land. Um, but if hag witches are given, for example, a mortal lifespan, they don't last maybe more than 100, 150 years or something, then yeah, no, that can't be the case. Then they're just going to have to be weird legendary things that are something different. Yep. Saurus Blood. Uh, actually, Oh, geez. I meant to show... Uh, there's a thing I meant to show Andy before the stream, um, but I will maybe bring it up here later in the stream when we're getting towards the end. There's an animation I need to show you that <laughs> might actually support something we talked about. Because it, it indicates that some of the Hag Witches are not... They're, they're puppets for spirits, as opposed to being actual humans. Interesting. Um, which I will show you that and after towards the end. Um, I like I'll, that. I'll just, I'll just I'm looking screen. forward to seeing it. Very I'll just exciting. Bring it up on fact. screen and we'll all watch it together. That um, sounds perfect. Source blood. Uh, there's, currently, time. <clears throat> there's a, currently a fan theory going around believing that Games Workshop is doing this because of what is going on in Eastern Europe right now with the invasion of Ukraine. I will say that is possible. Games Workshop usually does not respond to modern events, even when they probably should. Um, I don't think that's true. I'm going to be honest. I think Games Workshop is generally pretty good about understanding and hopefully the fans, which I know some fans are not, but if there's one thing you need to understand about Warhammer, it is not our world. And while there are things that may have like, oh, I could see a link between this thing in our world and this thing in the Warhammer world, you really don't want to do that as often as possible because you are going to fuck stuff up. Like you are yeah. going to get in so much trouble um, if you do that, like it's fine to look at the Warhammer world as it's inspired by certain things, but to go any deeper than that, I don't think that's how Games Workshop looks at their own IP. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> there is always going to be not just world 
event-based sensitivities, but cultural sensitivities with the various creations that Games Workshop put on let's say on screen in this case for Total War or alternatively in their armies. Um, and there is no doubt there are some people that just don't see that. They don't see any issues and they just make whatever they want. There are others who will see it and will argue that there's things that has to be done about that. Now, in this individual instance, the idea that the Ungles and the Gospodars are being made one, made one homogenous people to... I don't think that in any way makes any yeah, sense. Yeah, anything, that would make it worse. <laughs> it, it, makes, it makes it worse. In fact, it's one of the reasons that I didn't voice um, that I particularly don't like it because it dials down into a certain type of mindset that is not really ideal here. So I don't think that that is accurate. And if it is accurate, and anyone who's making those decisions is watching this, I hope you realize you're doing quite literally the opposite of what you intend by doing that because you are just uh, literally the opposite of what you want to be doing. Yeah. The idea um, that the conquering culture completely and utterly subsumed the other cultures a hundred percent. And the conquering <laughs> culture is the only culture. None of the yeah. other cultures really exist because it's only us that exist. Oh man. It's just not a good line. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't, don't do that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I'm just like uh, British talking um, about, I, I'm Scottish um, and generally always have been Scottish and it's how I perceive myself um, while simultaneously fully accept that my bloodline comes from a variety of different places but I, I culturally very much I'm Scottish. I think much more Scottish than I do British. Um, I want to bring up one point um, just on the small side because I think this is worth pointing out um, because you know the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, Ky Kiev and Rus, Principality of Muscovy and all of that and more. Winged Lanthers do not come from Russia. Just yeah, no, Kislev you, is not, not Russia. Kislev is not Russia, and some writers for Kislev just forget that completely. Um, and they dial hard on just the Russian parts and they miss the point. So pardon me for interrupting there. No, no, you're all good. Uh Commander Bone, uh darn, shame so late. Ah, you're all good, dude. I uh, want to say I'm still bone the Hagmother's retcon. Understandable. They could have left them, but made Ostinkia as the great Urhag. The others are wise women uh for Kislev settlements. It'll be interesting to see when we get a better exploration, either through like an army book or maybe mm -hmm. like a, a cubicle seven Kislev expansion or something. Um, mm -hmm. Right now, it's it's impossible to say because they didn't really comment on like what happened to all of the other hags. They just said, no, we just feel Ostenka is the only like Lord level version, um, yeah. which is like that could mean a lot of different things. And it's really I hard to extrapolate. It's really From weird there. as a choice as well, because it basically means that they're saying that the hags don't have gradation. It's weird. Where yeah. every every other wizard out there sort of does. You start off as a wizard, you move to the equivalent of a wizard champion, up towards a wizard lord, those who sit at the top. Then you have maybe your legendary lords, as, I don't know, someone really stupid like Balthazar Gelt or something pops along and is an individual character that represents and personifies what that group of characters is. To simply say there's like a single level of hags and then you've got one hag mother is an interesting line to take because it's quite different to how it's done elsewhere i'll be super intrigued to see what happens when they add more detail yep and letter this this is a good point that once again is going to be hard to tell when i first saw games workshop making kids more unified i thought they were hinting at this was a consequence of as of our cool with all, all the after effects it could be it's the article does specifically meet, talk about that it's eighth edition specifically they're talking about not the old world maybe in the old world we'll see more separation between the cultures but yeah. it's still a weird choice it's um, a really weird choice of language i agree um and i think it would be a weird choice to have um people's all band together and say we're one people now because i don't know if you know anyone that is culturally from a different group to say yourself they tend to maintain their identity even when you have a multicultural society because we have multiple identities within us we might come from a particular culture but we might also have ourselves a national identity that stands separate to that or perhaps we have a racial identity that stands separate <clears throat> to that if you consider things in such ways um and these are not easy to erase and they're rarely erased just because someone has a big fight and wins that's and, not really the sort of thing that's going to make that happen. And the thing is, I think you would tell a much more compelling and um, heartwarming, if you want to say it, story to talk about how these different cultures that used to have a lot of issues instead mm. came together after a crisis as oh. opposed to fusing after a crisis, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, that is a more realistic interpretation of that. Like, of that, oh, Kislev 
when you go there, relations are so much better than they used to be before Asmar Kul's invasion because these people learn to set aside their differences and work together against a greater threat. Now, granted, that's not going to, that still, the thing that's important is that still allows for clashing, though. That still allows for your Kostaltans, who's very obviously a Gospodarian that wants to homogenize Kislev through force, which mm -hmm. makes him a very interesting antagonist. Or, but to be fair, especially if you're looking at the Ostankia story or other tales or just thinking about chaos during the end times, you could argue that Kostaltan isn't entirely wrong, that his method might be what's needed to survive. Uh, but that's what makes for a compelling character. Whereas if you homogenize everything immediately, it completely loses a lot of that internal strife. That'd be like going to the Empire and saying, oh, well, okay, there's no more about like Midlanders and Reichlanders. That's no longer a thing. They're just the Empire, which mm -hmm. some books do that. And it's boring. <laughs> Don't do that. Um, all right. So um, the I'm bringing up that. Let me just bring up that little comment. Oh, because we Jesus. <laughs> hey, um, <laughs> we could actually do this during the stream. We are only 20 subs away on the YouTube channel from uh parole if you want to give my if you want to give my editor an anxiety attack 20 more subs right <laughs> yeah game. i just noticed the chat but looking at it i was like are we holy crap there's only 20 to go holy so there is crap, only 20 to go so if everybody watching just now on youtube just happens to press sub we're almost certainly going to get across that we line which her. is we which is which is pretty impressive march wow. march will be the month of queek it will be the month of queek holy moly yeah. that is amazing hey that's <laughs> uh, dude if we could do that during the stream come on chat y'all got like 30 minutes go 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 bother all of your friends and stuff and get 20 more subs we could do that during the stream that'd be amazing um superb so do we have any super chats we need to move through having had a nice big long uh thing, we got, we got one last one we which one last is <laughs> kiss love high school musical yeah exactly you yeah you, you don't want to lean into that Actually, um, I'm 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 going to call that for exactly what it is. It is like a kid version of it, a, without yeah, Disney, any without Disney any complexity Disney. or depth. And I understand why that will occur for certain products. But to say that all products have to do that uh, from the licensing department, for example, is for me um, an unfortunate outcome that I have seen happen more than once in the past. And almost every time it has happened in the past they change their mind about two or three years later as they move into a new cycle of how their products work. Uh, Lador, hey, that's a totally fair way to interpret what was written in there. Um, that is not how me and Andy took it, but that mm. is, you know, that the Games Workshop was wanting, that they are simply wanting to say that there's less tension, but they're still distinct. I wish they reinforced that better if that's what they did mean by it, because the, the following parts where it talks about how you're not going to see any more separation mm -hmm. between them um like the it, you know they're, they're just kislevites um mm -hmm. kind of acts counter to that interpretation it does and and letter if that's the case then you know that's pretty cool it doesn't feel frightfully realistic but that's at least allowing for multiple cultural identities to exist within the setting which is better than just homogenizing them all yeah um which yeah okay yeah. so uh just because we're getting a little long time i'm going to push this onwards uh so we got Let's get chaos yeah so oh no uh, gold knight okay, yeah real quick, gold knight yeah uh, gold knight ah gold, oh, gold knight very cool character so the gold knight is a new concept that's been introduced where the gold knight is basically the bodyguard personal champion representative of the czar but what's very unique about them is that they represent a meeting point between the faiths of kislev and the uh the the ice court um, yeah. granted from the wording it talks about the great orthodoxy in the ice court which kind of implies Granted, the, the writing of the article implies that the Golden Knight is very, very old, um, that there's been a lot of different Golden Knights. Uh, it even talks about how some Golden Knights were brought up from the Druzina, which are literally mm -hmm. Ungol, in, which is what it's implying is Ungol, or from among the common folk, uh, where people who have been very, very impressive have been brought up to this role and that they've kind of acted as this meeting point between a very contentious piece of Kislevite culture of faith versus magic which is very unique. And I love that. Like the empire doesn't have anything like that. Yeah. Um, it's lovely. Where someone is representing like essentially like the cult of Sigmar or the other cults and the colleges of magic, like that is unheard of um, for uh, many other cultures. 
So the fact that there's a person that gets blessed by all these different aspects and it's supposed to kind of represent Kislev coming together, I like that a lot. Um, uh, especially the current one, uh, Narieska Lesa. Uh, it's awesome to have a lady who is gigantic. Um, based on how she's designed in the game, uh, granted, uh, legendary characters sometimes get a little bit of size boost, but even when you compare it to other characters, she's like seven feet fucking tall. Like yeah. she, she towers over like Bretonian characters and paladins and the vampire lords. She's huge. Like she's the Brian of Tarth, essentially, of Warhammer, which is kick ass. Like she's a massive character and she's a giant lady who is there to kick ass and chew bubble gum. <laughs> um and protect the Zarina ass and chew gum and all yeah. that gum. Um, I have nothing to say on her other than I really like the character. Um, I think going into any more depth here is not going to provide us with anything extra given the hour that we're at. But That's I will true. say I really like the character. This is an example of a character that I think has drawn upon the existing background and added to it in a really beneficial way. Absolutely great. Yeah, I also love the way the golden suit of armor turned out. I like like the way she yep. wears the cloth and the way her armor is stylized and everything. Looks really cool. Very yep, awesome. Looks really cool. A lovely character. I find I it very it. funny that her dad doesn't have a name. Uh, and Gates Workshop apparently refused to give him one because in every piece of context you find about him, he's only called the Golden Knight or Narieska's father, Mister Lesa, I assume. Uh, but they never give him a first name, which is really although. Funny. Probably not, given that if we go by any of the older documents for Kislevite naming practices, you take your your uh, name oh, from, okay, so a, have, as a woman, your mother, if you're, if you're human, a uh, woman, pardon me, you take it from your mother. If you're a man, you take it from your dad. So Yeah, so never mind. We have no idea what this is. Would not be either. Mr. Lisa. <laughs> yeah, which is funny, from from mom. it's like he's dead. You figured they could just throw a name to him, but I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> yep, nope, not in this uh, instance. Nobody wanted that responsibility. Um, all right, so Zinch, uh, is the last thing to kind of really touch yes. on. Uh, Zinch, uh, got a lot of very, very cool things. Um, a lot of them are just kind of staples that we don't need to focus on too much with like your cockatrices and your mutilin vortex mm -hmm. beasts and whatever. Um, one of the things that was very interesting was the whole marked beastman kind of controversy where <laughs> uh, uh, Total War added uh, centigores of Zinch, uh, which mm -hmm. cool, fine. Uh, Zinch or Centaurs could take Marks of Chaos back in the day, so that's fine. But then Games Workshop did something very interesting, which is that a lot of people, because of the success of Age of Sigmar, have become very, very fond of Zongors, which yep. in Age of Sigmar are a subspecies of beastmen that have bird beaks, uh, and they're really, really cool looking. They have a lot of bird like features, they got little feathers, and they have bird feet and bird beaks. But for a lot of people, I think myself included, that is what we often just thought Zongors were in Warhammer Fantasy because the term Zongor originates from Warhammer Fantasy along with Pestagor, Korngor, and Slongor being the different like main marked beastmen. There's been a lot of different minis made for them over the years from White Dwarf art magazines to kit bashes that Games Workshop featured, as well as a lot of different rules on how they would work from White Dwarf articles to older mm -hmm. books like the Hordes of Chaos book um, and going back to like 5th edition, 4th edition and even further back. Um, so like they're a very present thing. So when they came out in Warhammer, they were they were not super exciting looking like they were unique, but they weren't crazy unique you know they they had kind of nastier looking mouths and they had really cool horns but they weren't like super heavily mutated which is what they were in warhammer fantasy is that zongors yep. would look very distinct from anything yep. else you would see um so surprise surprise games workshop comes out of left field uh in mm. this article that they had ca right at gunpoint and said <laughs> of that uh, no, Zongors are not going to be unique looking in Warhammer Fantasy because the ones in Age of Sigmar are a entirely separate species, which to be fair to Games Workshop in AOS, it's true that the Zongors have their own origin myth. They are not regular beastmen. They're something very different. Um, but it's weird to see them come out and be like, no, Zongors that look very zinchy are just not a thing anymore. And it made everyone go, what? What? Okay, so um, I have pretty strong opinions in this one, but they are only opinions. I think it's bullshit. 
Um, mm. I think it's bullshit that you don't get yourself something that's relatively unique. Do they need to look like the Zangors that we have in Age of Sigmar? No. Does that mean that they could be in a position to create a model for them? Sure. Now, Zangors, and indeed, Gores to each of the Chaos Powers have been around since 3rd edition Warhammer. They've been going forever. This is not a new idea. I remember back when I worked for Games Workshop a bajillion years ago, and I was in a miniature painting competition, as you do. Um, and we were uh, running this company-wide, and they sent all the miniatures that either were ancient or were no longer released and we got a section of uh, beastmen for each one of the chaos powers most of which weren't released and trust me when i say that you do not know, want to know what the slangors looked like they were unreleasable <laughs> utterly unreleasable um but even back then slangors looked different all of the chaos powered beastmen had their own unique look now, does that mean that they have to look like Sangor's Mage of Sigmar? Fuck no. But does that mean they have to be dull and boring? Again. Well, it's like no. they could have had little tentacles or feathers or bird feet or yeah, just indeed. something. But I think this speaks to what we were discussing earlier on in the stream, where it's quite obvious that Games Workshop want to have very clear distinctions between Age of Sigmar and Warhammer, whether that's the old world or whether that's 8th edition uh, licenses, much like Total War. I, I'm pointing over there because that's where I'm currently looking at the picture. <laughs> Much like Total War. Um, and they clearly want those differences to be there. And you can see this even with the old world release schedules where they're saying things like don't use your total, uh, I mean, your Warhammer uh, Age of Sigma models for Warhammer. That's not what they're there for. No, 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 that's not how it works. Yeah, which no. anybody with a brain is going to go, fuck you, I'll do what I want. <laughs> fuck you, I'll do what I want. And that's what they're going to do. Um, but it appears that Games Workshop simply don't like this. And whether it's simply something really dumb like um we want to ensure that we can track the sales for age of sigmar correctly and just know the age of sigmar set sales which to me sounds stupid or whether it's because there's internal issues at games workshop where you've got your age of sigmar crew and you've got your warhammer old world crew whether it's anything else it doesn't fucking matter when you are disappointing your fans by telling them that the thing that they want can't be done because of stupid reasons all you're going to do is get well get messages like poor Richard's message here where he's like, no, it's games workshop. Um, <laughs> Please, it, I have a family. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I, I read that bit and I was like, what on earth are they doing? What sort of bizarre conflict is there going on up there somewhere where they're trying to say the Age of Sigmar is so cleanly presented this way and Warhammer must be different to the point that you're not allowed to do anything with it at all unless it look a bit like a Zangor. It just left me cold. Yeah. Um, yep, we'll yep, stay yep. Uh, for all the other scene stuff. It's cool. Yeah, very good. <laughs> like, uh, monsters and stuff, and all that things are fine. Yeah, awesome. Uh, the new, I, I, I will say, I really love that for the Exalted Hero of Zinch and the Chaos Lord of Zinch, they dug into some old minis where the oh, Exalted yeah. Hero is like a really old, like fourth edition uh, mini. I painted that model like four times, so I was super pleased to see it. I was like, holy no. shit balls, look at uh, that one. <laughs> the Chaos Lord of Zinch is pulled from a very, very iconic piece of artwork from, I think, the sixth edition Warriors of Chaos book or Hordes of Chaos book. Yeah, you can um, see the you can see the influences of um for those of you out there who played Warhammer uh Age of Re was it Age of whatever Age, Age, of Reckoning. Warhammer, yeah. Age of Reckoning, yeah. Um uh and that Warhammer War was a great game. Um and it it really imprinted a host of looks that this model pretty much almost copy pastes. Yeah, well, um, it's it's the games workshop at the time. The uh exact uh, model from I, I want to say there's a piece of art in the Hordes of Chaos book where it's like I think it's each, Hordes of Chaos. Yeah, it's like <laughs> each page shows like a different army of the Dark Gods, and there's like a big Chaos Lord front and center, and the Zeke yep. one is exact. Like he's got the big helmet and everything, but he looks great. Mm -hmm. He looks awesome. Just lovely. Uh, I will say the new lore for the Changeling is I love it a lot. The fact that you could send him to any theater and he has like a whole bunch of mm -hmm. stories about all the different people he's trying to fuck with and like the various ways he messes with them. Uh, one thing that I would love to do with Andy once he's got his new computer room set up is actually go through and look at all the Changeling schemes because they're really fun. Um, and like exploring what that would actually result in uh in like a lore scenario like his empire one is literally him causing a civil war between the cult of ulrich and the cult of sigmar and it's brilliant fun. it's super <laughs> fun um, that brings a smile on my face i, I will so for those those of you who are so where's my computer it's currently all set it up for going out in my garage as we said we're building a studio out there it's uh it's currently half done it's lots of bits of plastic and wood and all the rest but they're 
hopefully finishing by the end of next month. So that'll be it all done. I move Exciting. in. Exciting! And you will no longer see me in this room because this room is also getting gutted because its ceiling is collapsing. Uh, My house is falling just... apart. <laughs> Uh, Narneska, I like big girls. Do you, my dudes? Uh, hey, you know, I I like many things, and big I like are among big them. butts, and I cannot lie. <laughs> yes, that too. <laughs> uh, Luring Lion, what other race factions do you guys think we'll see in Total War Warhammer 3? And what are the top three you each in the like uh, For me, if 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 you're like, hey, you get to pick three like new factions Anything. to come into Total War. Uh, yeah, that's a, such a shit answer, Andy. <laughs> no, 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 that, that wasn't my answer. I'm like, oh, I can okay, choose yeah. it. I wasn't saying anything. I was, I was like, like oh, I can come on, man. choose <laughs> anything. Oh, uh, well, I've got some ideas. I think for me, the first is Koresh because I love reptile type things and getting a whole snake man faction mm -hmm. sounds super duper awesome. Also, they sound like they have like bio terrors, which I love the idea of. Uh, the second one for me would probably be the Fishmen, uh, just because there's so much <laughs> mythology and stuff behind them. And I think they could actually pull it off and it'd be really fun. And third, just because so many people say it can't be done, I want to see Araby. Right. So I'm um, I'm somewhat similar. I want to see an advanced civilization from the Southlands, um, because mm. it's about freaking time that we started boiling away from the old world. Um, I would really like to see that. I would like to see a different sub civilization from the north of uh, the New World. So something that fills up all the space that currently is left by the Dark Elves. There's something there. What Na is it? Nagaroth or Nagaroth is huge in the Dark Elves. Nagaroth, I mean, they only yeah. occupy a teeny tiny part of it. They're, they're basically in Canada. There's like yeah. loads of it to go. Um, and there's a vast empty amount of space that I would like to see filled. Um, and as obvious as the last answer is, because we did do a stream in it, I also would like to see them. Uh, tackle the fishmen and i know that sounds almost like a joke and ridiculous but as we covered with the fishmen um stream there's not just a lot there there is an absolute ton of material there that they're continuing to hint at to this day and as we covered in that stream there's a whole lot of cool stuff that could be brought to the table with it that really does make say for example the vampire pirates look like they're land-based it would be i think super super fun and very different to anything that we currently have with warhammer yeah that being said we would happily take you know kingdoms of end Nippon, yeah Nippon. Uh, i mean Talea, Nippon can take Nistalia. its time because i want to finish my one first yeah. Nippon, <laughs> please games workshop don't release Nippon for at least four or five years thanks very much <laughs> <laughs> commander Vaughn, uh hoping that if it all goes well the bc boys will get more marked beastmen to the point of getting a chaos champions of chaos tier roster expansion that'd be great uh i feel yeah. pretty confident we're gonna get pestacore pestigors with the upcoming thrones of decay um mm -hmm. i'm very curious what they're gonna do with them um but we'll see yeah uh that being said like uh funny enough you could find uh you can find representatives of all of them now because Zongors and Slongors are in Age of Sigmar. But interestingly, Pestigors and Korngors are in Blood Bowl. So, mm. uh, A funny mix. Yeah, it is. Hammond, uh, there's some gores in this house. There's some gores in this house. I said certified new Zongors seven days a week. That's definitely a rap song lyric. And also, that's a, not how you spell week. <laughs> 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 uh, you know it's reaching the end of the stream when we're criticizing spelling <laughs> certified freak yeah thank you uh to the northern oh uh, yeah we we answered this sean uh it we is did. very very likely they have bumped into one another it probably was not friendly but like andy said you could tell some really fun stories with how dwarf magic resistance would make the hags dealing with the dwarves very difficult yeah it'd be fun um, plus, there's um, long been discussion of the northern forts and similar, um, the deals and interaction they've had with, say, Karaka Drak or any of the northern holds of the dwarves. So, yeah, there definitely has been contact multiple times. All right. Uh, and now we're going to burn real quick through the Discord questions. And then I'm going to show y'all and Andy the cool thing I wanted to talk about really, really briefly. And that'll okay. be the end. Let's so, burn fast. Uh, real quick, uh, uh, not more than a sentence for each answer. Good, good luck. Uh, so all this does ask. I wanted to ask quick about the uh, the moon bird. The fact that it's a yin line creature. From what I know, does this mean that yin stuff would tend to be cold and hot stuff would tend to be yang? Well, hot tends to, or yang also tends to represent kind of like sunlight and brightness so, and like burnt. So yeah, I would say that's fair because yin is also darkness and night mm -hmm. and shadow. So which is tend to be cool. So 
honestly, that's probably a fair assumption. Um, mm-hmm. Do we have any idea on how the Cathay Sentinels move around? They literally walk. Um, you, you see in Total War, they walk. Uh, there are even some that are part of the Great Bastion, and they become animated when there's a threat, and they can pull themselves off the Great Bastion, or they just fight from it, um, which mm-hmm. is really cool. Uh, are they all actively powered by the Celestial Emperor? I imagine they have been imbued with magic, and yeah. that they are self-sustaining so long as the winds exist. Um, that tends to be how constructs function. Um, that once you wake them up, there are usually designs in them, kind of like uh, there are designs to draw magic in from around more them. than a sentence. Uh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> are, uh, are the things in the woods still a werewolf type creature that, uh, probably, uh, but we probably, yeah. Um, I, uh, potatoes, not a question as much a prompt. I love to hear pitches start message. Ah, I appreciate that. We're going to skip that one. Uh, just cause that's <laughs> a very total war specific thing. You can ask me that in another stream. Um, do either you or Andy think it would have been nice for the changeling to have leaned more heavily into the cult angle with a lord level cultist character? No, because I want to save that for Egrim von Horseman. Yeah, that'd be really nice. Um, we don't get Egrim. I'm gonna start crying. <laughs> uh, what is your favorite of the Egrim. additions to Shadows of Change? Oh, that's really hard. Um, I think for, for me, the frost worm oh, is my favorite good. new thing. Um, that's a toughie. There's a oh, lot of good a stuff. Toughie. I really um, like I, the lore of hags as well. Right. I'm going to call it the Celestial Lion because I freaking love it. Um, oh, that's it. There you go. I freaking love it. When I saw it, I was like, holy shit balls. I don't need to try and figure out how to draw my one because they've done it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what would be Mother Ostekia's opinion of foreigners? If an empire merchant or Bretonian questing knight accidentally stumbled into their lands, would she try to lure them out to safety or would she slaughter them and feed them to the forest? forest i imagine it would depend on what they did yeah um like when you're dealing think about how those fairy tales work uh with like wandering into old dark forest with like witches or hags and stuff and how kiss of white ones are very similar um there would be unspoken rules that if you happen to not break you probably get to live yeah it's a judge of your character it's not a judge of your nationality or where you happen to have been born and if their character shines through is true i'm sure it will be fine i mean that's not to say you're not going to be absolutely terrified um but you'll be fine but if <laughs> you your might, character you soil yourself but you'll yeah <laughs> but if your character's not fine then woe betide uh feral Seraph, what do you guys think about the recent warhammer community article uh where games workshop said they do not have any current plans to bring kislev or Cathay to the tabletop it's a footnote but it's still a really weird post from them it is really weird uh i have some stuff coming up on that but i can't talk about it yet uh because i still need to do some further research but uh th- yeah things are weird over there right now i don't know what's going That's on over there bullshit yeah and also it once again completely conf- uh contradicts what they said not even two years ago which indicates there's some there's something going on mm-hmm. um i don't know what but something all right so the last thing is i'm going to share screen. Ooh, shit to that uh i'm gonna do a share screen here and we're gonna check out a little video somebody sent me so there is a rare death animation that can play in total war warhammer 3 on your hags Ooh, it i'm is very ex- excited it is extremely rare it is in the game but you only have, I think it's like a three to 5% chance of it playing, which indicates that not, because most hag witches, when they die, they just die. Like they just fall down and die like a normal person. But sometimes this can happen, which I think indicates, and I, uh, 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 I'll say it, I think indicates that some of the hags are not as human as they appear. So everyone check this out. So the hag dies. And what then the that fuck? rips out of her body <laughs> and digs away. Oh, I love that shit. That That's is super cool. So, uh, because yeah, normally it's oh, look just at that. you have like, but this seems to indicate that some of the hags have things living in them. Yeah, I'm well up for that bullshit. Um, um, but um, the one where it like wait. literally rips out of her body, like, oh mm. my god! Yeah, I love that. Yeah, and pulls them down. Oh, I love that. Uh, the, the spirits from beneath. That's pretty cool. Love that. Yeah, that was worth sharing. That was worth having a look at. Yeah, but so who knows? Maybe if you're dealing with something like you know the sea hag or some other kind of entity, maybe that is more what they are instead of the regular ones. 
Yeah, I mean, there's lots. It'll be super interesting to see where eventually it goes because then hopefully we can add more detail. (laughs) But as it currently stands, there's just a complete lack of it. Yeah. But anyway, uh, so uh, yeah, that's cool. So yeah, uh, careful with hag witches. They might have horrible spider demons living inside them that will rip out when you kill them. (laughs) But uh, I think we're pretty much wrapped. Um, I think we are too. I think that was a really good one. We got through pretty much everything. Um, We got to have a good look through both i think the things that we obviously really really like and i think it's uh, somewhat telling to see that as old fans of the setting it's the new stuff that excites us most because it's going in new directions and also doesn't contradict anything from the past where we have had somewhat more let's say commentary <laughs> <laughs> that has largely been on where they have taken something before and changed it into something new and it doesn't look like they've changed it into something that's necessarily better or even all that different so they've made it a bit simpler they've homogenized it a bit and they've taken away some character leaving us with something that's possibly not as good as what we had before but that doesn't mean that it won't develop into something that was much much better with a little bit of time because as you often find with this stuff It simply does. Now, before we go, I'm going to double check what the subscriber number came to and whether we passed the point, did we? We're on 4999. One okay, can one person real just quick one person let me go just subscribe to Lawhammer so we can end on the 5k? That'd be <laughs> awesome. We need oh, that's one amazing. more fucking person. Okay, be one person out there. Can someone be the hero? You have you an approximately... like, we'll give you like two minutes while we chat for just a second. <laughs> uh, okay, that being the case, what will we do for the last two minutes other than a crazy little Warhammer down? Uh so A Warhammer, uh, Warhammer. We, uh so someone just just make make a new YouTube account real quick. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Um, uh, uh, so, uh, we do have another, I don't know if it's going to be, <laughs> um, uh, so, um, we will have another episode of the who would win series coming soon. I don't know if it'll be this week for sure. Probably at the latest next week, but maybe this week we'll see. Uh, we got to check some scheduling stuff. Um, uh, do you want to tell them who it is? <clears throat> there it is. Yes, and, you know, given that we've just passed the 5K, I think it's only fair to say who it's going to be. Our next Who Will Win is going to be the might of the shining host himself, Tyrion. Manslayer, coming down from the rooftop... Rooftops? Coming down from the hills is what I meant to say. Wow, it's late in the stream. Um, To take on... Oh, who's it going to be? Who's it going to be? It's the High King of the Dwarves. Thorgrim Grudgebearer, who is, by the way, going to kick his skinny little ass. Guess which side I'm taking. So clearly, clearly, uh, Andy's <laughs> representing Tyrion. Uh, <laughs> so, so yes, uh, Andy is going to be back. Is going to be the is going to be the Thorgrim hype man. I'm going to be on Team Elf. Uh, so, which I think will surprise a lot of people, but we're excited for it. Um, bloody Elge! <laughs> no, bloody Elge! I'll uh, put you in your place. <laughs> so we'll have an announcement in the, in the coming days about when that will be either this week or next week. Um, and for the next lore beards, it'll be a vote. Uh, so keep an eye on Andy's channel because the vote yeah. will be on Andy's channel sometime after this stream. We're going to talk about it. As uh, we, get off. we certainly um, are. Where is Queek? Queek will be out in March. hundred percent guaranteed. <clears throat> it's but happening. I'm also going to say one other thing. Um, if it reaches near the end of March and he's not there, I am literally going to tell him to stop, take a breath, wait another week to make sure it's right and he's not too stressed. Because in the end, <laughs> we're all doing this for fun. And I wouldn't like poor old uh, lore master of Sotek over there to go into full on, full on panic mo- mode. But I will say I'm deeply looking forward to it eventually coming out. And thank you all for getting Andy to 5,000 subs. We did yeah, it. That was awesome. On, on the Lawhammer stream too. <sighs> Perfect. Uh, that was actually perfect. So um, the next one was 10k, and I think it was something to do with Gelt, wasn't it? Oh god. <laughs> yeah, it's a. I think it's a Lorebeard stream on Gelt, uh, oh, no. as well as. I mean, uh, do we have to? Yes. Yes. Okay. Why does Andy hate Gelt? I, it sounds like a freaking stream to me. Yeah, the it does. Deck. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 10, 10k. Here we freaking come, and I'm really not looking forward to it. While simultaneously, I will let loosen the bastard. Um, perhaps it should be. In fact, somebody just said what I was about to say. Perhaps it should be a Kremlo versus Kelstream. <laughs> as long as I don't, 
Yeah, but you know what they're going to do is they're going to want me to be Crimlone for you to be Gelt. So it's going to oh. be awful. <laughs> it's going to be us both trying to sabotage our own team. <laughs> no, this is why my team would lose because Crimlone is terrible. That's why. That'd be fucking amazing. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, that was a super fun stream, everyone. Thanks very much. We will see you next week. Um, if not before, if by some freak of nature we manage to get our Thorgrim versus Tyrion one ready before then. <laughs> uh, yes to that, and thank you to that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, my God. Yeah, yeah. Force, force your loved ones to subscribe to Live. Uh, <laughs> All right, we're we'll out of here. You all later. Right. Bye bye. Bye bye. See you later.